All right, folks, we will go ahead and call this regular September 24th commission meeting to order. Uh, before we get started, I want to recognize the absence of Commissioner uh, Farmsworth. He has a family emergency that he's going through. He won't be here tonight, so I'd like to go ahead and excuse his absence. Commissioner Coleman. I go ahead and uh, uh, excuse Commissioner Farnsworth, September 24, 218 meeting. Thank you, sir. Do I have a second for that motion? Second that motion. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Any questions or comments on the motion on the floor? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Motion passed unanimously. Before we approve the agenda, <coughs> I want to take this moment to recognize a historic occasion. Uh, Allison Folds, who began Folds and Walker many years ago, has joined us here tonight because uh, Scott is otherwise engaged. So we are, are proud and, and honored to have you back in the chambers with us. If you haven't had a chance to meet uh, Mr. Folds, um, he's, the, he's the one who started it all. And uh, it's been a long relationship, so it's, it's uh, nice to have you here with us, sir. And with that, I will have a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda, so written. I have a, a motion to approve the agenda. I have a second from Commissioner Coleman. Any questions or changes to the agenda? Does the public have any questions or changes to the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Well, you please join me in welcoming Pastor Gary Bracewell from Christian Life Fellowship, better known as CLF, to the podium so he can give us our invocation. After the invocation, if you would remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Pastor Gary. Thank you your honor and commissioners and glad to be here tonight father thank you so much for the opportunity to gather and conduct this business for this wonderful city Lord we're thankful for a place to live where uh, we can enjoy so many freedoms so many blessings Lord we are truly blessed and for that we are grateful and we give you thanks father I just pray that you would continue to give us unity I pray that you would continue to grant us peace and Father, as we work together for the betterment of those citizens here and all around the world, Lord, we just thank you and just pray that you give wisdom, that you give direction, that you just give understanding and just guide these uh, commissioners, these that have been given this uh, responsibility of uh, leading this city forward. And so Father, we just thank you for that tonight. And we do pray for Commissioner Farnsworth, for his family, that you will just uh, meet that need as well. And Father, care for them. Lord, we love you, and we give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> thank you, Pastor Gary. And before you leave, I, I want to take this moment to thank you again also. Uh, for those of you who have been following, Newberry has engaged in a, a truth and reconciliation process. We had our first meeting um, a few nights ago. Uh, our next event is on November 18th. Um, and what we're asking is that all the pastors in town give a sermon that Sunday on healing, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, um, and then invite all of their congregations in the entire town to Lois Fort Park so that we can eat together. Uh, and fellowship together when I called up uh, Pastor Gary he not only agreed to participate but he won us one better and he uh, offered to merge CLF's Thanksgiving on the grounds with this event and help us feed what we hope to be five or six hundred people um, who will show up so I wanted to take that moment to make that announcement and thank you this is the first time I had a chance to see you in person but it's an incredible offer uh, it's really helpful I, I look forward to it. I hope everybody takes us up uh, and and joins us and, and Commissioner Glanzer, would you like to and I want to thank you too and to not confuse the public and those people that heard uh, it was originally going to be on November 11th at my little back lot but it grew so big and with the gracious offer Pastor Gary um, we had to move it to Lois Fort Park on the 18th so there will be no food on the grounds at my place on the 11th it, it will be on the 18th and thank good you so much for that thanks thank you Pastor Gary all right <coughs> Uh, we will move on to our first presentation. Is a representative from Ten Can here, Mike? Or are you going to take us through? Uh, welcome, I, Mr. Mayor. I believe we're looking for James Pearson. Awesome. Our representative is here. Come on down, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. 
Presented by um, Farm Credit of Florida, the Praxis Award was designed to recognize organizations and businesses that go above and beyond the, our mission. They, em they embody the core values and reflect the uh, Wario's ethos. These 10 partners stepped up to the challenge to bring, to bridge the gap to, in our community with in-kind services, hosting events, and fundraisers that helped us serve over 3,000 of our local families. You are our heroes to our warriors and the less fortunate. Let it be known that you are, you are among the elite group of rep recipients who have answered the call to serve our hometown heroes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you'll stay right there, we'll come get a picture. We certainly appreciate all the effort that Tin Camp puts into our community as well, sir. So the feeling is, is mutual. Thank you. Absolutely. And I also want to take the, this opportunity to uh, remind everybody that the second annual Mayor's Masters is November 18th. Tin Can um, is, uh, no, I'm sorry, November 17th, not November 18th. Yeah, I've got all confused. November 17th, it'll be at, uh, at West End Golf Course. All the proceeds go to Tin Can right there, the holidays, which is when our veterans need the assist they need assistance all the time, but that's that's a, a big deal for us. So last year was great. I think we raised just under four thousand dollars for them. Went a long way towards uh getting Christmas trees and, and all kinds of stuff right there, the holidays. Love to have even bigger turnout this year. So if you can come and play, great. If you want to sponsor a whole, let me know. Like I say, everything goes to Tin Can because they do everything for us. So thank you for what you guys are doing in the community. Okay, and we have a proclamation declaring October 17th as White Cane Safety Awareness Day. I want to go ahead and begin by reading this proclamation in the record, and then I'll invite the Lions Club up, and they can tell us a little bit about what they're doing in the community. Kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Mark Twain. Whereas with the growing use of the white cane is an added element, the wish and the will to be free, the unquenchable spirit and the inextinguishable determination to be independent. With these lives are changes and the prospects for blind people to become bright. That is what white cane safety day is all about. And whereas the white cane, which every blind citizen of our state and city has the right to carry, demonstrates and symbolizes the ability to achieve a full and independent life and the capacity to work productively in competitive employment. And whereas every citizen should be aware that the law requires that motorists and cyclists exercise appropriate caution when approaching a blind person carrying a white cane. And now therefore I, Jordan Marlowe, by the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Newberry, do hereby proclaim October 17th, is that right? Our proclamation says October 15th. October 15th, our proclamation is right, our agenda is wrong. <clears throat> Do hereby proclaim October 15th, 2018 as White Cane Safety Awareness Day in the city of Newberry and call upon our schools, businesses, and the public to utilize the available skills of competent blind persons and to open new opportunities for the blind in our rapidly changing society. And upon all citizens to recognize the white cane as a tool of independence for blind pedestrians on our streets and highways. In witness whereof, I he have hereunto set my hand and caused to be affixed the official seal of the city of Newberry, Florida, this 24th day of September 2018. The Honorable Jordan H. Marlowe, attested by the clerk of the city commission of, D of Newberry, Florida, Miss Judy S. Rice, the city clerk. Let it be proclaimed. Mr. President, will you come down and tell us a little bit about, I'm sorry, let's get our picture here first before we do that as well.
Okay. Tell them what they need, they need to know. Let them know about what's happening in Lockyer on the 13th. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, Council of Blind have worked out an agreement with the Alato Lions Club many years ago to give a demonstration walk to make the public aware of the white cane. It has been noted that for every three blind people who get hit by a car, one is fatal. And, a reason, and the person who does that is a person who does not know about the white cane law. So to make the public aware of the white cane law, we have a demonstration walk going on in Alachua, starting at the old City Hall parking lot, which is next to the Alachua City Library. And you will be those sighted people who will be blindfolded and walk to walk with a guide will receive a white white cane shirt free to as a part of the participation and after the completion of the walk, those who are blindfolded will participate in a five task challenge like pouring coffee, sign a, your card, your name straight, and uh, put away <coughs> a uh, band-aid on your finger and unlock a door. These will give you a, a insight in what blind people deal with. It's not easy, but we can be independent, but we do need your assistance. It, <clears throat> understanding by walking those footsteps, you can understand a little better the assistance that you can do to help a blind person have the quality of life that you have. So I invite all of you to come and participate in this walk, October the 13th, 10 a.m. to 1. And by the way, the Boy Scout Troop 88 will serve hot dogs and soft drinks for lunch for those who participate. Awesome. And I'm Darrell Bowden, president of Newberry Lions Club, and I'd like to thank all the commissioners and the city of Newberry for everything they do to help us out, especially you, Mayor. Y'all make it all possible for us to have events and things that make it possible to be able to help people. And thank y'all. Well, we appreciate the help that you give. So anything we can do to help you help others is what we're here to do. Well, and we appreciate much. all that you guys do. It's been an amazing turnaround. Our uh, purpose is turnaround. to help those are less fortunate than ourselves. Where there's a need, there's a line. That's right. All right. Mm -hmm. I know I've heard I that like somewhere. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming Thank tonight. You. We appreciate you. Yeah. Okay, folks, we're going to move into our public announcements. Um, <clears throat> I would remind you the public announcements at this time of the meeting are for less controversial announcements. There are two minutes where you can just tell us about a garage sale that's going on, something that's happening. If you have a longer comment that you'd like to make, we have another section at the end of the night where you have a, a longer five-minute period of time. Chair recognizes Mr. Marlin. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Marlin Day, um, library manager, the Newberry Branch Library, the Alachua County Library District. Um, we have a couple things. First, this Thursday is our Banned Books Readers Theater program. Uh, local teens will be reading from books that have been banned or challenged over the years. Uh, we had a rehearsal tonight, and the Readers Theater has really come together fun. Uh, the teens are having a lot of fun, and uh, we hope that members of the community We'll turn out to support them. That's going to be on Thursday, September the 27th at 6 p.m. <clears throat> also on Monday, October the 8th, Gracie, the Clydesdale horse, uh, will be at the library at 4.30 p.m. Gracie is part of a certified animal-assisted therapy team with pet partners, and her handler will be talking about some of the work that she and Gracie do in the area. So I'd like to ask that you please share these items with your constituents. Thank you. Absolutely. Do you have any It'll be Monday, October the 8th. And the Clydesdale name is Gracie? Clydesdale's name is Gracie. Well, I yes. like it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other citizen announcements? Do you want a two-minute announcement or a five-minute stump speech? Uh, Your pick. I'll do a two-minute announcement. I you can do a two-minute and then five-minute at the end. Yeah, I'll just do five minutes outside for everybody wants yep. to <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Gregory Caudill. I am uh, one of the people running for Alachua County Commissioner for District 2. Uh, I, I'm going to take some of my two minutes just to thank you all for the work that you do with 10CAN, to thank 10CAN for the work they do with our veteran community. 
I'm a veteran. Uh, I always love to see uh, people working with the veteran community. You know, we're a, a group that um, we receive a lot of support these days, and it's very much appreciated. The uh, professor that has an office across the hall from me is a Vietnam vet, and he often tells stories about wow, the reception he got when he came home. And so how that's changed, uh, how my generation uh, is received uh, is very meaningful to us, uh, and we, we appreciate the support that, that your community gives to us, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, I'm just going to be real brief. It's two minutes, right? Uh, I'm running for county commissioner primarily for uh, my, my guiding principle that the person most qualified to make decisions about your life is you. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I think that government should be there to empower people to make their own decisions and not to, uh, uh, to administrate every decision that people make. I'm also running for county commissioner for what I don't know, which is I don't know how to run your city better than you do. These people chose you to run the city, not me. I don't know how to run your business better than you do. I don't know how to run your life better than you do, and I'm not going to try. So on those uh, two basic principles is uh, what I'm basing my campaign for county commission. And uh, you know, I, I'm not currently a resident of Newberry, but we uh, just uh, started talking to realtors and are looking to move to the area. So uh, maybe oh, I'll be here as a go. resident soon. There you <laughs> go. All right. So thank you very much. Well, and, thank uh, you for coming out tonight. Thank you for undertaking public service. Uh, it's a huge commitment. Uh, <laughs> yes. it's, uh, 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 we've all done it at the municipal level. can't imagine doing it at the county level. But I know what it's a toll it takes on you and your family. Uh, if you, you couldn't have picked two better bases, uh, principles to run, and we appreciate that platform. So we wish you all the luck. Cheers. Thank you. And he'll be available outside for anyone who wants to hear the stump speech. Yeah, I got, I got <laughs> Uh, any other two-minute announcements? Hearing none, we will move to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion from Commissioner Hersom. Second. A second from Commissioner Glanzer. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. And we are on to public hearings and ordinances. Item A is our discussion and adoption of the final operating millage. <coughs> we have duly advertised, and I'm going to say that when I end the script at some point. End of second paragraph. In the second paragraph. Um, <coughs> in order to make sure we have hit all of the legal points that we are required to hit, we have written this down in a script. Uh, so we're going to spend the next few minutes making sure that we do our dual di diligence and read through this script as we set our budget uh, we don't want to discourage any questions or comments <clears throat> just understand this is our second reading so this is the second time we've read it through this script to make sure that we get this right um, and with that we will begin the city of newberry commission hereby convenes the public hearing on the city of newberry fiscal year 2018-19 final millages and final budget as required by florida statutes chapter 129 and 200 Chapter 200 requires that a final hearing on the city budget be preceded by a two to five day notice of that hearing right here. Chapter 129 requires that the city commission advertise a summary of the budget again right here. Here are the proofs of publication that such notices have been given again right here. A summary of the city budget has been provided for public review by means of advertisement in Latcher County today on Thursday, September 20th, 2018, pursuant to these requirements. If anyone in our audience is here for the purpose of contesting their assessment, a petition for adjustment with the Value Adjustment Board should have been filed no later than 5 p.m. Tuesday, September 11th, 2018. The petition forms were available in the property appraiser's office. This evening, we will take a number of actions related to the adoption of final millages and budget. I encourage you, if you have not already done so, to get a copy of the agenda so you may more easily follow the proceedings this evening. Citizen comments will be taken following the overview of the final budget by the City Manager and Director of Finance and Administration. The City Attorney will now present an overview of the Truth and Millage legislation, followed by the Director of Finance and Administration's explanation of the final and rolled back millage rates. Mr. Attorney. legislation was to ensure that taxpayers were advised of the public hearings at which 
the local taxing authority, budgets, and village rates are considered and adopted. Uh, I thought that was on. Uh, each taxing authority then notifies the property appraiser of the proposed millage rate, its rollback rate, and the date, time, and place of the public hearing to consider the proposed village millage rate and the tentative budget. Once the property appraiser receives the information, he sends a notice by first class mail to every taxpayer on the assessment roll. The notice contains the information from taxing authorities as to the proposed millage rate and the time and place of the public hearing. The notice sent to taxpayers is called the trim notice. The trim notice lists what the taxes were for the prior year, what the taxes will be in the proposed budget changes are made, and what the taxes will be if no budget changes are made. This information is listed for each taxing authority. The notice are listed all voted levies for debt service. The purpose of the trim, the purpose of the trim is to provide taxpayers with sufficient basic information to enable them to participate in the public hearing process. <clears throat> During this year's budget process, the commission held four budget workshops and one of two public hearings to publicly discuss the budget for fiscal year 2019. City staff has compiled a budget with direction from the commission giving during, given during these meetings. We were able to create a budget with direction from those meetings that has continued funding for renewal and replacement of infrastructure, continued emphasis on public safety through our fire department and law enforcement contract, and support for the city's economic development initiatives and programs. We were able to accomplish all this with no increase in the city's fire assessment rate and no change in our property tax or ad valorem rate and only minor adjustments to our utility rates, which allows us to continue to operate self-sustaining enterprises and invest in our utility system. <coughs> Dallas Lee, our finance and <coughs> director of finance and administration, will now present an overview of the final millage rate and the budgets for fiscal year 2018 <coughs> and 19 and changes made to the final budget from the tentative budget. One of the requirements of the truth and millage legislation is to provide information about why tentative millage rates are higher or lower than the rolled back millage rate. The city of Newberry's final millage rate of 5.9999 mills is the rate at which the city commission has through due study and consideration determined is needed to fund the municipal operations of the city of Newberry in the best interest, public health and welfare of its citizens. The final millage for the city of Newberry is 5.9999 mills, which is 5.24% more than the rolled back rate of 5.7014 mills. The rolled back millage rate is defined as the millage rate, which exclusive of new construction, additions to structure, deletions, and property added to, added to geographic boundary changes. will provide the same ad valorem tax revenue for each taxing authority as was levied during the prior year. The final millage rate is the same rate as was levied in the prior year. However, the trim process required that a notice of tax increase be advertised since the current year proposed aggregate millage rate exceeded the calculated aggregate rolled back millage rate. The aggregate rolled back millage rate is calculated by dividing the prior year estimated property tax revenue by the current year taxable property value divided by 1,000. The current year taxable value does not include new construction and annex values. The final total citywide budget for fiscal year 2018-2019 is $24,655,376, which is a net increase over the tentatively adopted fiscal year 2019 budget in the amount of $100,020. This increase is due to an adjustment of reserves carried forward relating to capital projects. The final general fund budget is $8,090,609 dollars, which is a net increase over the tentatively adopted budget uh, in the amount of $100,020. This increase is due to an adjustment of reserves carried forward related to capital projects. The final capital improvement budget is $49,062. There are no changes between the tentatively adopted budget and the proposed final budget. The final special revenue funds budget is $1,046,443. There are no changes between the tentatively adopted budget and the proposed final budget. The final debt service funds budget is $101. There are no changes between the tentatively adopted budget and the proposed final budget. The final enterprise funds budget is $14,409,838.
There are no changes between the tentatively adopted budget and the proposed final budget. The final internal services funds budget is $1,059,323. There are no changes between the tentatively adopted budget and the proposed final budget. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my comments on the changes that were made to the tentative budget presented to you on September 10, 2018, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about the budget at this time. Does the commission have any questions for Dallas? Does the public have any questions for Dallas? Again, I don't want anybody to think we're taking this flippantly. This is just our, if you add in all the workshops, our sixth time going through this. It's definitely the second time doing this one. Okay, hearing none. I would now, wait a minute. Well, I just did. I would now like to invite citizens to comment on the fiscal year 2018-19 final millage rates and final budget. Please come forward to the podium if you wish to address the commission. We do request that each speaker, speaker try to limit his or her comments to three minutes. The hearing will continue until everyone who wishes to address the commission has had an opportunity to speak. <coughs> Again, hearing none. All right, I will now close the public comment of this public hearing. And <coughs> Dallas. Mr. Mayor, the document before you, the City of Newberry Fiscal Year 2018-2019 final budget, includes the changes that were described earlier. Any additional adjustments to the final budget must be made by motion at this time. Okay. Does the Commission wish to make any adjustments to the proposed budget? Hearing none. Okay. Florida, stat oh, Florida statutes require that the name of the taxing authority, the millage rate to be levied, the rollback rate, and the percentage increase or decreased over the rollback rate be publicly announced. Accordingly, the City of Newberry City Commission has determined that a final millage rate of 5.9999 mills is necessary to fund the final general city budget. The final millage rate represents an increase of 5.24 percent from the rollback rate of that's the wrong number 5.7014 mills. However, there is no change from the previous year's adopted millage. Mr. Attorney, uh, Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners, the resolution before you is resolution 2018-34A. It's a resolution determining and adopting the final rate of taxation on real personal property and making the annual levying of an ad valorem taxes for the city of Newberry, Florida for the fiscal year 2018-2019 and providing an effective date. Okay, do I have that motion to approve resolution 2018-34? I have a motion from Commissioner Martin, a second from Commissioner Coleman. Are there any discussions on the motion on the floor from the dais? Does the public have any discussion on motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passed unanimously. Mr. Attorney. Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners, the resolution before you is resolution 2018-35. It's a resolution of the City of Newberry, Florida, relating to the city's budget for the 2018-2019 fiscal year, providing for the final appropriation of funds of the city of Newberry for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2018, and ending September 30th, 2019, approving a final general budget, adopting the five-year capital improvement program for the city, providing authority to city management prescribing the terms, conditions, and provisions with respect to supplemental appropriations and reappropriations and making a determination of public purpose, providing for severability and providing an effective date. The appropriate motion is to approve resolution 2018-35 as read by its title only. I have a motion to approve resolution 2018-35 by Commissioner Martin. Second. I have a second from Commissioner Hersom. Is there any comments on the, about the motion on the floor from the dais? Any comments or questions from the public on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Dallas. Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners, the next three items relate to your utilities. I will first discuss the water and wastewater rate uh, ordinances and then electric rate ordinance. The City of Newberry establishes water and wastewater rates to generate revenue sufficient to meet its operating expenses. Staff evaluates utility rates annually during the budget process and if warranted recommends rates be adjusted. Staff utilizes models for developing its water and wastewater rates to forecast customers, water consumption, wastewater generation, and anticipated expenses to determine whether rates will produce revenues which are sufficient to meet the expenses associated with providing water and wastewater services to our residents. 
Many of the city's costs to provide these services are fixed or have increased. Water rates were adjusted by 2.9% in the consumption charge and $1 on the customer charge for an average residential impact of $1.41 per month. Wastewater rates were adjusted by 1% in the consumption charge and no change in the customer charge for an average residential impact of 48 cents per month. These rate increases also work towards the commission's goal of operating self-sustaining utility enterprises. Both of these rate increases keep the city's rate sets as some, if not the lowest rates in the area. These rates will become effective for bills rendered on or after October 1st. Customers were properly notified pursuant to Florida statutes in the August bills. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my comments on water and wastewater rates. Does the commission have any questions for Dallas on the rates? Okay, Mr. Attorney. Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners, the item before you is Ordinance 2018-15, an ordinance pertaining to water service within the City of Newberry, amending the prior, establish, establishing rates and amending Section 98-154 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Newberry, amending Ordinance Number 2017-28 repealing all ordinances in conflict and providing an effective date. Okay, the appropriate motion is to approve ordinance 2018-15 upon first reading as read by its title only. Do I have that motion? Motion to approve ordinance 2018-15. Okay, I have a first from Commissioner Coleman and a second from Commissioner Martin. Is there any discussion on the dais on the motion on the floor? No. Does the public have any questions or comments on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners, the item before you, ordinance number 2018-16, an ordinance pertaining to wastewater service within the city of Newberry, amending the prior established rates and section 98-155 of the Code of Ordinances of the city of Newberry amending ordinance number 2017-29 and repealing all ordinances in conflict and providing an effective date. The appropriate motion is to approve ordinance 2018-16 upon first reading as read by title only. And I have a motion to approve ordinance 2018-16. Motion to approve 2018-16. I have a motion from Commissioner Glanzer. Second. A second from Commissioner Coleman. Are there any questions or comments from the dais? on the motion on the floor. Does the public have any questions or comments on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Dallas? Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners, the City of Newberry establishes electric rates to generate revenue sufficient to meet its operating expenses. The City of Newberry's electric rates have not been increased since at least 2009. Staff evaluates utility rates annually during the budget process and if warranted recommends rates be adjusted. Staff utilizes models for developing its utility rates to forecast customers' consumption, bulk power cost, and anticipated expenses to determine whether rates will produce revenues which are sufficient to meet the expenses associated with providing electric services to our residents. Many of the city's costs to provide these services are fixed or have increased. Residential electric rates were adjusted by 1.01% in the consumption charge and $1 on the customer charge for an average residential impact of $2 per month. Non-residential and security light rates are proposed to be adjusted in a similar fashion. Even after these proposed rate changes, the city will continue to offer competitive rates when compared to other utilities, as demonstrated by the peer comparison in your backup. Customers were properly notified in their August bills. The city will need to file additional reports with the Public Service Commission to inform them of the proposed rate changes. These rates will become effective for bills rendered on or after October 1st. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my comments on electric rates. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners, the item before you, Ordinance 2018-17, an ordinance of the City of Newberry, Florida, pertaining to electric utility services in the City of Newberry to amend and revise Section 98-63, subsections 1, 2, 3, and 8 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Newberry pertaining to the energy charge, providing for codification of the same, repealing all ordinances in conflict, and providing an effective date. The appropriate motion is to approve Ordinance 28-17 upon first reading as read by title only. Okay, do I have that motion? Motion to approve 
Okay, I have a first from Commissioner uh, Hurston and a second from Commissioner Glanzer. Any questions or comments from the <coughs> dais on the motion on the floor? Are there any questions or comments from the public on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Dallas, do you have any closing comments to give us? This is your project. Uh, you have shepherded us through this very professionally and gracefully. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I'd like to just um, thank everybody involved in the budget process. Um, it's a very arduous process that we start in January, so we're about to start it again. Uh, we also have audits starting next week, so busy times here. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, particularly my staff who's worked on the budget, all the department heads, the city manager, the city commission and the public who's been involved in the process so, thank you thank you city manager uh, mr mayor just to echo you know comments from our tentative budget dallas he everybody does work hard for the budget dallas as our director of finance kind of takes budgeting to a whole new level in terms of effort um, that can never be underscored enough um, department heads same way there's an immense amount of time that goes into preparing a budget and i know we kind of uh, in these last two meetings um, go through it in 15 or 20 minutes and it, it may tend to minimalize, minimalize the amount of effort but there are hours and hours of meetings beginning in January to now and you know Dallas spearheads the whole thing he's a great project manager and the staff really participates all the way down to our newest hire if you've got a good idea about how to um, how to budget better so that we provide a higher level of service at a better um, economic uh, opportunity saving money for our residents we want to hear about it and we want to incorporate it in our budget so we just appreciate the Commission's guidance um, and latitude for giving us the opportunity to prepare the budget and I would echo those comments I've you know I've said it before but I've had um, the chance to uh, go through sort of two models of budgeting and I would say that at this point we have this down so that everybody has a chance to feel very educated to feel very comfortable to understand these numbers because from an elected official perspective you come in and even if you're a business person you're used to running audits and budgets and those kinds of things it's an intimidating uh, process to work through and you you guide us through it you make it comprehensible and we appreciate it uh, it's all above board and it's all about the numbers and so thank you again for you know all the work over the summer <laughs> that, that we did uh, to make this happen uh, and with that we will end the public hearing and we will welcome Commissioner Farnsworth we're glad you're able to make it here with us tonight um, and you got here just in time to miss the approval <laughs> of the budget well done we are moving now to agenda items we'll begin with resolution 2018-22 uh, the adoption of the quasi judicial procedures and we'll start with a introduction from mr thomas uh, thank you mr mayor um, just a reminder a little background uh, staff was directed to look for ways to improve on our quasi judicial procedures uh, I don't think there were some things about it the elected officials weren't real thrilled with and uh, the board members that dealt with them and the staff so we were looking for a way to improve on what we already had um, the changes in the uh, proposal are uh, based on the following areas um, the order of the presentations for quasi-judicial um, presentation of uh, a provision for third parties to execute uh, or to provide expert testimony and witnesses uh, which are called party interveners and there's a third button that's not there but basically what it says is the um, uh, amount of time thank you <laughs> in the, it's in the, stuff where, the amount of time that um, that uh, for public comments it's not moving forward so we'll just go ahead and I'll wing it um, we've got it here in front of us as far as the as far as the order of presentations um, we felt that it would be better to add um, a staff overview uh, basically just an introduction by staff of what the application is about it wouldn't entail any of the um, things staff report or any of the uh, staff recommendations simply an overview to really act as an introduction to the applicant coming forward and then presenting their testimony 
um, it seemed a little awkward uh, to have the applicants start off the, the process or the presentation without some kind of an introduction. And so uh, we're, we're proposing to, to include that. Um, we had some uh, requests from uh, residents who've been part of the process for uh, the ability to have some kind of a third party, uh, we're calling it the party intervener. Um, basically, it would give uh, parties a status uh, to present expert uh, testimony and witnesses as well as just the applicant or the city um, on those two parties. Um, you may have uh, groups that have a particular interest um, outside of just the general uh, public interest of we like it or we don't like it. You know, there may be some, some very specific reasons why a third party group or groups might want to be able to present, bring an attorney or uh, provide expert witnesses. And so um, this will provide for that. Uh, there will be some con you know, conditions with that. They'll have to come forward uh, and, and identify that they want to be recognized as a party intervener. Um, they'll have to um, be approved by the chair. Um, the chair will basically review the materials submitted and decide uh, whether or not uh, they qualify as a, as a party intervener. And then um, and they have to provide all of a, an outline of what the, uh, what the request is and all the background documentation uh, to go into the staff report for the agenda item when it, before it gets posted. And then, um, let me back up. You're back on track. We're back on track. I think we might have Except a dead battery here. That's I think okay. It says red, so maybe it's and then, get turned on. Um, for public comment, right now, uh, currently the, the uh, public comment section, everybody's given up to five minutes. And especially when you have a, um, a room full of people and it's a highly contentious issue, and for the most part, you're divided, you know, people that are in favor, people that are against, and they're all kind of saying the same thing after the first two or three rounds. Um, it, uh, it can add significant amount of time to the, to the process. And so um, we're recommending that we go to three minutes for uh, public comments, which actually aligns it with what the commission does in all the other areas. Um, it makes it consistent across the board for public comment of, of pretty much all kinds related to commission uh, business is three minutes. And it's still an adequate amount of time to, to present your, uh, your case, whether you are in favor or opposed to a particular item. Um, so that, um, in a nutshell, is uh, the majority of the, of the changes. There's some other technicalities that um, the city attorney may want to uh, address, but uh, for the most part, that covers uh, just about it. The one thing that, um, it, in this is an area, it's not specifically called out. When I went and reread, um, the chair does have the discretion, uh, the chair has fairly wide latitude to grant extra time um, in most situations. It doesn't specifically call it out in the, in the proposal, so we could always add specific language to that um, in there that the chair has that discretion. It's kind of assumed. but. Uh, if, if that's uh, an item that we want to solidify. We could add that in. Okay, does the commission have any questions for Brian about this? Commissioner Glanzer. Just one comment. I, I feel a little uncomfortable reducing the amount of time the citizens have. I mean, I don't mind listening. They pay us mm -hmm. to be here to do that. And I, I know that it's repetitive, but maybe by, if 10 people say the same thing, I get it. <laughs> maybe I you know, need to hear it 10 times. So uh, it's just my opinion. I don't, are we voting on this as a... Well, we have the option uh, to use tonight as a conversation um, and send Brian back with some notes to tweak it. If you guys like it, we can vote on this tonight. I think the, the idea was to draw some consistency across the board in what we allow. Um, and I, I think that the, especially the issue that instigated the look at the quasi-judicial what ended up happening was that, uh, you know, we went till about 1 o'clock in the morning that night. And I think across the board, everyone is willing to listen. Um, but by probably 1130, no one was really making any new arguments. People were saying the same thing and kind of reiterating it over again. And, and a lot of people were using the full amount of time, even though they weren't putting forth a new argument or a new stance. Um, now, it's completely up to the up to the dice. I don't think it makes a, a, a tremendous amount of this difference, you know, which one it is, but we do three minutes for everything else. And so it's, you know, it, it's y'all's procedure. You can make it, you can set it at the time. You know, the general thought is if you can't get it out in three minutes, 
you needed to to work on it a little bit more. But you said they could. May I ask you? Uh, did they? You said they could make a request to extend it another minute or two. And well, that that's one of the things we need to talk about. <clears throat> the party intervener, the chair, uh, the the you know the way that this works is our in our. our the existing quasi-judicial procedures that we have gives the applicant an unlimited amount of time. If there is a concerted effort by a group of people who are, are going to willing to go out and get an attorney and their own planner and present a case to the PNZ and then to the commission, <clears throat> there is no um, procedural avenue that would allow them to do that. So they bring in an attorney and an engineer to give evidence and they basically have to sit there and listen and then they get up and get the same five minutes but they don't get the ability to have a powerpoint they don't get the ability to make a presentation to uh to provide evidence so the idea in this proposal is to f is to figure out a way to allow uh if we have a a group of citizens you know that want to get together and say we're all going to band together and, and address this issue and we're willing to hire an attorney an engineer and a planner uh, we want to make a presentation this would allow them to do that okay. so that and I, I think it's a little unclear the way it's written here um, the party intervener so let's say you got 12 people who all want to uh, who all share the same concern they could designate one person as their spokesperson and then that in one place in article 5 it says party interveners the chair shall allow a person to intervene as a party intervener if they meet the following requirements However, in the beginning, it says, um, and forgive me, my iPad went on the fritz and all my notes are in it. In the beginning, it says that in two definitions under party, it says party shall mean the applicant, staff, or any person recognized by the decision-making body as a party intervening. So I'm not clear if the chair has unilateral discretion to recognize somebody as a party intervener or if the board has to vote to recognize somebody as a party intervener and I'm not exactly sure logistically how this plays out so let's say I make a bless you Mr. Mayor yes Mr. Uh, uh, Rich Mulvey one of our partners at the office has worked extensively on this and he may be able to address those questions that you're bringing up or that the commission may bring up. Awesome. Would you like to step to the to my Did I did I stump you on this one, or do you got an well, answer for this? Extensive. I'm stumped on the word extensive <laughs> there. That's that's an overstatement. But no, um, I I have worked with 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 Brian a little bit on this over the last uh, few days, and um, I do think that maybe there could be some clarifications made in some of those things you're pointing out. Um, what, what, just as a general comment and sort of a starting point, um, this is derived from Florida statute and what we're doing here, in my opinion, is already actually far beyond what the requirements are of the statute. The statute actually says that um, the, the governing body doesn't even necessarily have to have an ordinance or resolution that has a procedure. Uh, but by default, then, you're going to be governed by the statute. Um, so to uh, uh, Commissioner Glanzer's um, comment about uh, limiting uh, the public to three minutes, the statute actually doesn't even say uh, anything about that. It talks about parties, and it talks about party interveners. Um, the other interesting thing about the statute is it actually doesn't define party intervener. Um, so that might be something that um, we want, we, we may want to consider adding further clarification for as far as what is a party intervener, who designates who that person is. Um, the way I currently read what, what's drafted right now is uh, the chair uh, of the decision making body. So that, that person um, in, the, in the planning and zoning context would determine who is a party intervener uh, when it comes before the commission um, it would it would be the uh, the mayor in that case um, so there is that issue there in terms of there being two different people um, but you know in speak in talking to Brian about that I mean I do think that that is um, manageable in terms of um, having two different people 
uh, determine who that person, who, who the party interveners actually are. Um, that might be something for the commission to discuss whether whether they would prefer that it be somebody designated uh, at each level who makes that determination. And just for the commission's uh, memory, when I took uh, the office of the mayor, I suggested to you that we uh, rework the PNZ before the mayor sat as a voting member of the planning and zoning committee. Um, and we had a, a clean bill of health from legal to do that, but it did create some some potential for sunshine violations. If I vote on the PNZ and then I, you guys ask me a question about it, now I got to stop and think, well, wait a minute, is that something that I can talk to you about because I voted? So my suggestion was to model the PNZ after the commission, have five uh, PNZ members, and I would act as the uh, chair. Uh, that got a little bit muddled in my communications, and now I'm more a liaison. So the PNZ has a chair. I'm not. I don't serve as the chair of the PNZ. I'm more. I'm now strictly a liaison to come back and, and discuss and update you guys on what happened. So if you designate it the way it's written, and you allow the chair, and I think we do need to clarify whether it's the decision-making body or the chair unilaterally determines if somebody qualifies as a, as a party intervener. Uh, if you go with this verbiage, you would have two different people. The chair of the PNZ uh, would make the first decision if that person's a party intervener, and then they'd move to you, and then I would make the decision if they're a party intervener. So it, it, it may, since the way the PNZ is structured, the mayor will always, until, unless you guys change the structure of it again, the mayor will be the liaison. You could unify it, and the mayor would be the person that would uh, identify the qualifications of a part, what counts as a party intervener, which we still need to have a little bit of conversation about what counts as a party intervener. But, uh, and I, so I want to reiterate, we don't have to make any of these decisions tonight. You can sleep on all of these things. Or none of this is time sensitive. We've been working on our quasi-judicial for about six months or so. so it's not like we've got to make this decision tonight. Is that right, Rich? That's that's correct. Okay, but but that would be the first sort of thing that you that we want to think about. Do we want to have two separate people identify that this person has met the qualifications and now they get a legal right to present testimony in a quasi-judicial? Do you want to make that uniform across the board? Um, I'm willing to go through this with some of the other concerns, but I don't want to. Usually I'll let you guys ask your questions first. You just want me to kind of take you through some of these issues that we've been discussing for the past six months? Commissioner Hersom. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I guess with the, the idea that all the, a party intervener has to have all their material in ahead of time to be posted with that, then I, I think giving the body the, the, the power will be difficult because we don't unless they bring forward information a meeting ahead of time there's no capacity for anybody whether it's PNZ or, or the Commission to make that decision where they, they whether they're a party intervener or not um, part of me says if they're rec rec recognized as a party intervener at the PNZ level and then it has to come to Commission they should still be recognized as a, a party intervener it can't be you know, with the idea if there's two decision makers recognized at one the subs the subsidiary level and not at this level seems you know, silly yeah would be the best word I guess um, and, and then I'm curious as to what the, the qualifications might be for a party intervener also well, when if I you realize that's a next step in this discussion if you turn if you look at B uh, and article 5 there um, we still haven't quite defined it, but I want to speak to your point about logistically how this actually would play out because there's a pretty good time crunch. So, you know, uh, I got 10 days notice roughly to find out that we have an issue. Um, and then the party intervener has to have it in by the Wednesday before the PNZ. Obviously, we're closed on Friday. So if I, if I am a party intervener, I basically have about five days to recognize that issue is going on that I might want to intervene in. And then if you look at B, this is what I've got to submit. 
at least five days prior to the hearing, a person shall submit a written request to intervene, including a detailed outline of their interest in the application, an argument in favor or against it, copies of all exhibits which will be presented at the hearing, and the names and addresses of all witnesses who will be called to testify on their behalf, including resumes for any witnesses the person intends to qualify as an expert. Uh, that almost seems too big of a hill to climb in a five-day window of time if I'm, you know, I'm just a regular resident going about my daily life and I got five days to find witnesses, get their resumes, detail out a summary of my arguments in favor or against, collect all the copies of my exhibits that I want to present, and then get that all to either the chair or myself to determine whether I can be recognized as a party intervener. Um, the only uh, issue I can see with with where you would might have a situation where somebody is recognized at the PNZ as a party intervener and then that designation wouldn't follow is if they weren't able to actually collect all of this stuff but the PNZ chair out of an abundance of caution we never like to say no we never like to reduce a time limit we always want to be overly responsive to residents so the chair I can't really see a, a, a situation where the chair denies somebody the recognition as a as a party intervener they're going to say okay you are but then in the the remaining weeks between that while they're working to come to the city commission they can't collect any of this stuff so they don't have any expert witness so they don't have any exhibits so then we get they get to you guys and they wouldn't really fit this definition of a party intervener anymore am i am i way off base here rich or is there some merit to Oh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to work through this right. issue. Right. You're pointing out some. Uh, you're pointing out some issues. Um, I think the five days um, is suggested here uh, because, you know, if you were to shift it towards the other end of the spectrum and say um, three days, then you're, you're sort of putting the burden on on the staff to turn things around quickly. So and we're closed. <laughs> right. On Friday. Right. So. so so there's there's that there's that issue um, to deal with. But also keep in mind that um, there's also the discretion uh, by the board to perhaps table an issue if somebody with good cause demonstrates they need more time to prepare, you know, something like that. Um, you know, there's ways to accommodate that. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, I would suggest is that this, while it's important that we come up with a process here that appears like it, it will work, uh, we can always adjust it based on how it's actually working. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's also that part of it, too. If we agree to, a, a say, a five-day period today and that seems to be unworkable, then there may be another day where we take that issue up and say it needs to be changed to four days or three days or something like well, that. Well, what I would actually suggest is, I mean, I, I don't really see a way around the five days because it, it kind of is what it has to be. Uh, in terms of aligning with all of our other notifications and we're closed on Friday. Um, I, I am concerned that a party intervener becomes a delay tactic to the applicant of uh, now I have a procedural way to stop somebody else who maybe I'm just in an argument with, I don't like, I don't want their, their project to happen. So there's two sides of this coin that we need to be cognizant of and, and, and consider it to. But it seems to me, especially at the PNZ level, that the first part of this would be really the important part. So five days prior to the hearing, a person shall submit a written request to interview, to intervene, including a detailed outline of their interest in the application and an argument in favor uh, against it or for it. I mean, I, I think if we just get, if they submit in, in writing, here's my argument for it, here's my argument against it, without having to force them to get evidence and resumes and the professionals in that five day then at least staff and the chair or the mayor can read the argument and see if there's if there's a legitimate argument here a legitimate concern or if there's just this is just a squabble between two neighbors and there's there's never going to be any evidence for once it's just this is just a way to inhibit and delay somebody getting something done that they want to get done is there a couple thoughts on that, uh, and it's probably reiterating something that, that Brian already said, which is keep in mind that before 
we ever entered into this discussion as we currently sit here uh, there is n nothing in in the uh, procedure that sort of looks out for the party intervener so we're already making a huge step in the right direction even Absolutely. though we may not have an agreement on the timing or what actually needs to be submitted uh, so something is better than nothing and I don't suggest that that we stop there necessarily um, but but that's that's one one thought on that um, rich before you go to the next thought is there any rule or regulation about a party intervening intervener coming up with more information and evidence in between PNZ and Commission or can the party intervener only present what was to the Commission what was presented to the PNZ there, there's nothing prohibiting that okay. um, obviously inherent throughout the statute and the procedure is the concept of due process and so the only thing that I would uh, mention there is that if the intervener introduces a lot more evidence and doesn't give the applicant enough time to counter that then there may be an argument that could be made by the applicant that there's a due process issue which the is the flip side of, of what we're talking about with the party intervener here Commissioner Martin yeah I'm kind of getting lost in the discussion the two of you're having honestly okay. Me too. Uh, I, Sorry, this this has the, been a uh, six month discussion for us, so we're trying to catch up. Uh, as far as who determines who is this uh, party intervener, uh, I don't know that I want to cede that authority into one in one person. I think it's better to have uh, multiple people. Uh, I I think most of the time, <laughs> the commission that's up here, they can listen to whoever. Uh, is coming up here and just talking. I think we have an opportunity to, at that point, determine whether they're really credible, or they're really an expert, just by how they're talking and what they're saying. And I'm not really clear, uh, and maybe it's just my ignorance about the process, but is the party intervener going to be somebody who is probably against the applicant or for the applicant? And probably could it be against. both? Could the be. presumption would be to be against the applicant, but so this that isn't does a representative not. That's of the applicant. That's not necessarily always going to be the case. You're right. Okay, uh, I would say we, let's let's move on to other business and sidebar individual conversations that get up to speed because I'm uh, more lost than I want to be. I mean that that may be a good point because you know we've been talking about this for a long time and I've got about five or six more highly detailed. Uh, things that you guys need to think about okay. and then and we can bring them back uh, we've got a great start here um, but I'm not sure that we're quite ready and that's my fault I apologize I, you know I have not done a good job keeping everybody abreast of this conversation and it's can be highly detailed and highly technical but we hardly ever once we set a policy we let that policy play out for quite some time before we go back and and tweak it so this is kind of our shot at quasi judicial so would you guys like to anything else you want to present to the commission just to kind of mill around yeah just general comments to, to think about when you're looking at these things um, quasi judicial and, and I know reasonable minds can differ on this but quasi judicial is so, supposed to be something between informal and a judicial hearing so I point that out because the goal here should not necessarily be let's come up with a process that's that 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 would hold up in a court of law now to commissioner martin's point um when you when you say you know you you don't necessarily like the idea of putting uh the decision of what is who is a party intervener in one person's hands that that's a point that's well taken and what that reminds me of is if you were in a uh, judicial setting you have a trial court and then you have a court of appeals where you have two le levels where th they're making independent decisions and that's that's generalizing way too much there on that but but the, that's kind of the concept here if you were to have uh, the P&Z chair make a decision and then go in front of the commission have the commission make or or the mayor or somebody make uh, a decision on who is an intervening party um, so that, th those are some concepts to think about. Do we necessarily want to take it to the level where we're basically having a mini trial 
every time, or do we want something in between informal and, and a trial? So, Mike. Um, Mr. Mayor, just to, um, as I listen to the, the really get back and forth, it prompts me for questions I rich, wish I had asked when we were discussing this as staff. We had several meetings on it, but it took the great insights from the commission. Um, when I hear the term intervener, uh, typically if we're outside of quasi-judicial, I, I recognize that that is someone that is, um, I understand that someone's being recognized as the at, by a court as having an interest, a legitimate interest. Uh, so I, I think that that is a good point for us to go back and consider. It occurs to me, though, that, um, that the first crack at that might be our own city attorney or working in concert with staff uh, because if you're turning in uh, five days ahead of time, you kind of want to know whether you're going to be an intervener or not. But not everyone that says I'm an intervener <coughs> qualifies. You, you would have to demonstrate some level of expertise that is being presented and evidence that is being uh, presented and not. Um, I want 15 minutes versus three minutes, but really I don't have anything more to add other than I don't want this to occur. Uh, so I, th I think that if we're following the city attorney's lead in that this um, intervener uh, means something in a, in a full court of law, we're just simply trying to model that in our quasi-judicial hearing that maybe the first step would be uh, you know, the planning director or the city manager uh, upon counseling with the city attorney can determine that you are or are not an intervener. You could always appeal to the board at the meeting if the determination is not. But like you guys, like you tend to, uh, if you're going to err, you want to err on the side of being cautious. Staff's the same way. We don't want something to get overturned because we were quick out of the gate to decide that someone's uh, voice um, shouldn't count. Okay, so I think it's a good idea Let's table this. I'll get a chance to circle the wagons with you guys and, and sort of talk about what it took to get here and the issues that we're about to get here. We've got a great start. We'll, right. we'll continue working on it and we'll tweak it as we go. Is that, I got a head nod in agreement of that. Okay, uh, Mike, you want to talk to us about the holiday <laughs> schedule? Uh, yes, sir. And, and thank you to the city attorney and Brian for working on that. It's been about a year coming. And we are on the cusp of a great policy. Just a couple more um, wrinkles to iron out, and we'll be there. Um, Mr. Mayor, as you, as you know, we get to this time of the year, uh, holiday season can impact our meeting schedule. It's rare that Veterans Day is the first culprit, but this year, Veterans Day is going to impact the first meeting that we hold in um, November. Uh, it's going to be observed. It's actually on a Sunday, but it's observed on Monday. Uh, so that'll be a city holiday. So staff uh, proposes that we have our meeting normally scheduled for the 12th of November to be moved to Tuesday the 13th of November. Um, the second meeting in November is scheduled for the Monday after Thanksgiving. It's always a little inconvenient, um, but it is a very necessary meeting for, for us because we finalize our fiscal year 18 budget that night, and if we miss that deadline, we're in trouble. I don't know how much trouble, but it's a lot. Um, and then, um, then, so staff says we need to have that second meeting in November, um, and then when we move to December, the first, wing is, the first meeting is conflict-free. The second meeting is on Christmas Eve. Staff recommends that we move that to a different week or cancel it all together. Historically, staff, um, we, the, this commission has canceled that meeting. There's not a lot of business happening that time of year. Mike, what was the issue with the first meeting? In, what was your suggestion, staff suggestion? To move it, move to, the it to Tuesday the 13th. Okay. Uh, Thanksgiving is Monday. Thanks. Uh, the, we won't change the second meeting. It is scheduled for uh, Monday the 26th. the 26th, and staff proposes to keep that night. Okay. I would just remind the commission that, you know, our conversations with the county on two or three different fronts are likely to come to a conclusion rapidly somewhere in that time frame. So um, I don't, I, I absolutely think it'd be fine to cancel the second meeting in December. They won't be meeting then either. Whatever they get done, they'll get done, bef you know, a week or so before Christmas. But I would say we, we definitely need to make sure we have those other ones even if they're moving the times. Is everybody good with the staff's proposals, Commissioner Martin? I, oops. I don't have any, any conflict 
one way or the other. Uh, would it be <coughs> of any advantage to move the, the meeting after Thanksgiving also to the Tuesday night? Just not so you're not coming off not for us. four we're days and making we're trying to make sure everything is done on the Monday? We're used to it. What, uh, does that have any effect on posting dates or anything? Uh, no, sir. It just is, we'll begin preparing. Instead of so normally Monday is when we really get after it and we get it posted by Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we have a fabulous taskmaster that sits in the back of the room and she'll have us working on it the week prior so that it gets posted on Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. Well, to Commissioner Martin's point, though, if at any time staff wants to change their mind on that, okay. is the 27th available for everybody? Yes. Because there's likely to have something change in that week that you guys mm -hmm. might wish you had that extra day. So. And, yeah, I'm okay canceling the one on Christmas Eve. However, I mean, I'll reserve on in my head, you know, if something happens with the county that we are we forced back – into putting that on a date I will I prefer another date other than Christmas Eve but if It'd we do a have to have Christmas a second meeting in <laughs> if we do have to have a second meeting in December then uh, so be it and it's duty calls but tentatively I'm Absolutely. okay to cancel okay. wait no we're no, no proposing we'll, to cancel the second we'll cancel meeting. the second meeting the no. December the 10th is fine but we'll try to keep the 27th open in case staff comes back to us and says, actually, that was a great idea, Tim Pad. We could really use that Monday. Sure. Okay. Do we need a motion, Mike, or is the head nod? Um, fine. Would you like a motion? I, I'm fine without a motion. We you wanted a motion, get it, Rich? I saw he's, he shook his head. He always wants okay. a motion. We want a motion. Do I have a motion to accept staff's recommendations for the holiday? Motion to accept the, uh, the staff's recommendations for change dates for the commission meetings. I have a motion from Commissioner Hurson, a second from Commissioner Glanzer. Any questions from the dais on the motion on the floor? Does the public have any questions or comments on the motion on the floor for the holiday schedule? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Okay, now we are to our longer comments of the evening. Everybody will get five minutes, uh, and we'll begin with the city manager. We're definitely going to hold him to that five minutes. One minute. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just an advisement to everyone that Lachua County Board of County Commissioners has uh, got the county fairgrounds and Canterbury on their agenda for tomorrow morning. So I'll be in attendance um, for that meeting to be available to answer questions. Uh, we're, there's a lot of activity. We're uh, working on site plans. We're working on appraisals and surveys and negotiating prices of uh, property. Um, and we're going to pull it all together very quickly. We're trying to point for a uh, mid to late October. This is the plan uh, to present to both boards. So tomorrow's just kind of a, a status update from county manager or interim county manager Lieberman, who by the time she makes that presentation will likely be the county manager. Um, they're voting on that the item prior. Um, it's kind of an interim report and maybe get some interim direction from, uh, from the Board of County Commissioners. So that's going on tomorrow. And if there's anything eventful, I will report it to the commission by email. And Wednesday, on Wednesday, we're traveling uh, to Tallahassee. Uh, staff and I are, we're going to meet with uh, the Department of Economic Opportunity first to talk about jobs and grant funding for the city of Newberry. Um, so that's before lunch and uh, um, possible CDBG grants as well. And then after lunch, we're meeting with the Department of Environmental Protection to talk about wastewater treatment uh, facilities and our plans for future expansions. Wanted to let everybody know that the city's new website is up. It's pretty splashy. If you haven't seen it, uh, we'll make a brief uh, presentation for you at our next city commission meeting. Get that on the agenda. Uh, it'll be quick. It will not be painful. Um, and also, just to let you know, we've been working with um, ADG, who does um, all of our financial, uh, most of the software that drives what we do in the city, particularly the financial um, uh, software they also uh, <coughs> maintain all of our building uh, permits they've developed an online building permit interface uh, which once fully deployed will allow um, residents and builders to apply for building permits online make payments online schedule inspections online 
do everything online. They won't have to come down to the building department other than to submit building permits and likely a lot of that can be done electronically. Um, it's probably six months out, but it's very exciting. It will allow us to move right to the top of the list of people that are, um, that are uh, te technologically equipped in their building departments. And then my final comment is that um, just an update, we held uh, the, the first city run tournament at Champions Park of Newberry in a long time. We did some back in the summer of 15 and those were successful, uh, but we've taken a few years off. So our first tournament was over the weekend. Uh, we hosted a girls softball tournament. The company that was the sponsor was PFG, which is performance softball something, but um, girls softball <coughs> and uh, a great tournament. Uh, we had 44 teams and a full parking lot. It seems like girls travel better than guys. They bring in bigger crowds than guys on a per player basis. Uh, but I've got, we got feedback from attendees that was super positive. Uh, we got a lot of feedback from local businesses that saw a very um, big uptick in their business. I thought that was positive. And we have a couple more of these planned um, for the rest of the fall. We think that we anticipate our new contractor would be in the park sometime in the beginning of 2019. So we're trying to keep the park booked and used and have some revenue generated through the fall. And so we have a couple more tournaments planned. That concludes my comments, Mr. Mayor. Just to, to piggyback on that, because I spent a lot of time out of the park this uh, weekend, and I talked to the parents, talked to folks who were there. Um, I always like to be anonymous and just chat with folks and let them, you know, feel free to tell me exactly what they're feeling and, and experiencing at the park. And it was uh, all positive. I mean, it really, really was. People who had been there before um, complimented um, the job that Travis was doing. They, they, most of them knew him by name, which is amazing. Would you think that people knew him by name? Uh, that's not usual that the your Parks and Rec director, the folks are so familiar with, they say, man, he's doing a great job. Um, and, you know, I just have to compliment the city on running that and doing it. Um, you know, I saw Travis and Brittany out there picking up trash. I mean, it was all hands on deck. They kept the trash cans uh, empty. They kept the bathrooms clean. I mean, they were just nonstop 14, 15 hours a day making sure that everything was pristine, that folks left the park uh, with a great taste in their mouth wanting to come back and, and use, utilize that park again. So my hat's off to Travis. I know he's probably still sleeping from all the work that he's done to, to get that done, but it was fantastic and it really was. Uh, we got some parking issues though, because boy, that place was full, you know, so we got to figure out how to fit more teams in there because we're already working on that. We, we own 40 acres immediately south and we, and we might need and it. And we started soliciting quotations for uh, underbrushing on that property today. Awesome. Mr. Attorney, comments. Mr. Mayor, uh, about 37 <laughs> years ago, almost to this day, I started law school and my partner, now partner, he was my mentor back then, has been my mentor my entire career, said, why don't you hop in my, my white El Dorado Cadillac and we're gonna go to the city of Newberry and I'm gonna teach you a little bit about municipal law. And we did that mentally in Orfleet was the mayor, Gene Ellis was our law, or our city clerk. And, um, and Freddie Lee Warmack was on the commission back then. And, and in those days, the meetings would start at 7.30 and we could leave the office and Newberry was a two lane road. We'd leave the office after seven o'clock and get here in plenty of time that the, before the meeting would start. And the meeting would start at 7.30, but it would be over before eight o'clock and we'd have dinner and go be home by Monday night football regularly. That was how it worked. But he, tonight was a little bit of an odd night for our law firm because all four of our city cities were meeting at the same time tonight. So we dispersed and, and, uh, and I very much appreciate him coming here this evening. One of the comments on, I think it was attorney review, uh, was who's this Mr. Folds guy that we have on our, on our staff? And, and I said, Allison, if you don't mind, can you cover this tonight? And I know you did 16 years of doing this back in the time, but some of the folks over in Newberry would like to reacquaint with you. And of course, Monty knows Allison from those days. And, and many of you know Allison, but uh, I, I thought it was important that, that he come here and he gladly did this. So I wanted to say appreciation to him to, for doing that. Matter of fact, his legal assistant, Mary Coleman, who's in the audience this evening, 
she uh, said, boy, I've got to get there. I've got to watch this. <laughs> I want to see this. Deal. And, uh, and then also, Rich coming up here from the Archer meeting this evening and covering, you know, I want to let you know that we, we lost one of our valued personnel in, in Courtney, big city law firm, offered her big city bucks and a big overlooking office in downtown Orlando and all those things, offered her things we couldn't provide her. But one of the things that Rich said is that I, before we just hire anybody, let me learn about municipal work. Let me, let me get into the mix on that. He's, he's been a, a corporate attorney and done a lot of litigation and construction law and all that sort of thing. Now also has a, carries a LLM, now a tax attorney in, in addition to that. But he said, I want to learn about municipal work and before we just hire anybody, bringing them into our law firm, let's take our time and, and let's make our bench deeper with what it is that we're doing. So you're seeing a lot of the internal changes that we're making in our law firm, and I think for the better. We, we love Courtney. We'd love to have her on our staff. But with her leaving, that's made some changes internally on the way we approach things and the way we do things. And, and I think um, I'd commend rich as well as to the changes that we're making. He's a very strong part of our staff and, and we continue to build and continue to do the things so that we can do something like we did tonight and cover all four cities. So again, Mr. Foles, thank you very much for, for covering and thank you for being my mentor all these years and saying, hey, let me give you a ride in that big white El Dorado Cadillac <laughs> many years ago. 47 years. Well, thank you for that, Scott. We appreciate uh, him being here. Does this mean that uh, you're back in the rotation on a permanent basis? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to join us here once a month just for the fun of it? I'll have to ask my boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it has been a lot of fun, um, so we appreciate that. Uh, and my, uh, clerk is not here tonight. She sends her apologies. She is also sick. Uh, so we wish her a speedy recovery as well. And we'll begin with the commission. Commissioner Coleman, do you have an update on a volleyball game that's happening tonight? Uh, yeah. They, I'd like to know. I'm curious. Santa Fe just went ahead uh, uh, up two points. So Santa Fe's first and won the first and second set. So it's not good right now. Mm -hmm. And now uh, the Mayor's Cup. I, I've been sitting here thinking about this. And it's one of those deals if you can't beat them, join them. So I'm going to beg Monty, Commissioner Farnsworth, to be on his team this year. It's good Because, you know, it, it, I'm tired of losing. So <laughs> uh, that's uh, – and I'm going to put the offer out right now. I mean, if, if I got to, you know, run around with bottled water and whatever, whatever I got to do to be on that team, I want to be on it. You want a champion team. That's I get it. it. I understand. It's a good strategy. Commissioner Farnsworth, are you willing to commit right now to – Accepted. Unfortunately, my team has already been set. Ouch. <laughs> I heard Tiger. At the first notice that I got of the uh, mayor's tournament, I contacted all the all, the, all the, ring, all the ringers, <laughs> all the ringers in town. Yeah. I know it. Oh, yeah. Can, you know, also maybe looking at maybe just taking your place and. If you want to <laughs> caddy for me? You can <laughs> do that. Anyway. Okay. So. Well, we're going to find you a, a good team, though, to challenge. Yeah, but Mayor, Commissioner I, played, Glander, I played with you last year. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> we did great through the first six. <laughs> we won't say why. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Herschel. I don't know if I can follow that. Um, uh, Destiny Chris uh, Community Church is um, traditionally the Sunday after Thanksgiving has done a serve day. This year they're expanding that to a serve month, and so they are looking for service opportunities um, that to be identified in the city uh, and so if you've got any certainly DCC is open to taking those suggestions or you can send them to me or or other commissioners and, and we can forward those on um, and that's DCC dot is it DCC dot org destiny community yeah. church or you could put the request slash serve you can put the request right into their website so I'm glad you brought that up because I get requests all the time for help, uh, and DCC is going to take all the requests. They're going to divvy them up. They'll assign people to uh, in groups to do it. So, good call, Commissioner. Um, and then just one other thing, and I apologize for springing on, the, springing this on you. I've been contacted several times about people concerned about roads. Just 
Can we put a map on the new website that shows which roads the city owns and which are county roads to, to help citizens to identify the correct organization to contact? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and you'll recall um, we have the great big caveat of having 13 miles of roads that the county owns that we maintain by contract. So I'm sure there's still um, a lot of confusion over, well, who should I be calling for issues? But we're happy to work through that. We have gotten past the days of the county just saying, that's not our road and we don't want to talk about it. Now they acknowledge that it is our road. The city of Newberry maintains it. So we'll figure out which one of us should answer your, your question. But yes, we can work on getting a map uh, uploaded for you. And we are past the 45 days at our joint meeting. We identified to finalize the roads in the CRA, but we are dotting uh, I's and crossing T's from finalizing that, right? And it's pretty much in the county's it is, it is purview to, to in, bring that up. We've already voted on it, right? We, so we voted on the CRA. On the CRA, we haven't voted on the roads yet, but so that's that was one of the issues that uh, that you know we need these meetings in front of the holidays because you know, one of those meetings there's going to be about four issues you know, that are huge for the city of Newberry that will get decided. And just last question maybe is, uh, at one time we talked about having a joint meeting with the school board. Is that still in the works? Mr. Mayor, that request has been transmitted and uh, the feedback I got was they were just gonna coordinate with their chair and then we'd pick a date. Right now we're looking at November. Is that all? After the after, yeah. Any further comments? Commissioner Farnsworth? Well, when I got up here, I looked over to my left and I thought I was having a flashback. <laughs> Mr. Foles over there. Uh, I looked around to see if Methley Norfleet or Joe Cannon or my father was around somewhere because that's about the last time I've seen him at a commission meeting. Um, also, Mr. Foles used to give gifts to the commission like knives and stuff. Uh, but um, that stopped after you left. I just want to point that out. <laughs> and the last thing is, I looked at the new website and it's awesome. It's a lot easier to uh, maneuver around and, and uh, a lot less uh, uh, confusing as, it, as the old one was. So uh, I'm really happy about that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Martin. Uh, October 21st will be your opportunity to get a crash course on the Florida constitutional amendments that are going to be on the ballot. That's October 21st. It's going to be, that's a Sunday late afternoon over at the library. And uh, since Miss Peggy is not here, I will, uh, a longer term item is on November 17th is the fall festival that is uh, going to come here probably quicker than we we plan on. And it's uh, the Ag Tech presentation uh, on either of the websites? Um, yep. It is scheduled to be on them. I, right. I, I didn't look, but we'll, we'll, I'll make a note and we'll make sure it is. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Commissioner Glanzer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to thank Folds and Walker for their decades of service and representation for our city. I was actually a kid, maybe in my 20s, 20 something when I remember Scott up here. Um, but I was in the audience. I wasn't up here back then. But thank you for that. It's been a, a lot, a good time. Um, thank you, Dallas Lee, for your leadership through the budget. You make complicated issues understandable, and that's so helpful for me at least. And Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for your leadership and guidance with the truth and reconciliation process. Um, that first meeting last week was, I mean, the most amazing. I wish you all could come to the next one, well, which will be November 18th, Breaking Bread. It's, a, it's an important process we're going through, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, growing up, Girl Scouting was a big part of my youth and my daughter's youth, and I'm proud to tell you that Newberry is soon to have a Daisy Troop. They're pre-Brownies, uh, five-year-old girls, and they'll be held at the Newberry United Methodist Church. The starting date will be determined yet to be announced, and I'll, I'll update you on that. And uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Glanzer. Uh, we'll have our officer evaluations. It's that time of year again. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, according to our charter, the city attorney, the city manager, and the city clerk all work directly for the commission. Everybody else in the city works for the city manager. So it's time for us to do our evaluations of the three charter officers. We're going to give you that um, those evaluations at the next meeting. I need them back in one week's time to get to Deborah uh, so that we can have public discussion at the second meeting. Um, so that, that's kind of our timeline. Uh, the evaluations that we do will be the same. Um, what I was thinking about for the charter officers, we used to make them write the letter, which I never really found all that valuable. But having a list of goals, uh, uh, this is what I want to do, and then we can look back after a year and say, well, this is what we set out to do, this is what we did. I think that would be more in line. Would you guys agree that that gives us sort of markers to judge? This is kind of what, we're, what I'm setting out to do in my department, what I want to do. And we can go back, head nod, or if you got a different idea, let me know before the next meeting. Otherwise, that's the material that you're going to receive. And please try to get that back within the week to Deborah. It's important this year because we've tried to align it so that we can have the evaluations which are linked to merit increases and those kinds of things all at the same time. Um, so next meeting. I just wanted to um, thank everybody that came to the meeting on Thursday. Uh, I want to thank the city for, for providing us the, the venue. Um, and I want to especially thank uh, Amy. She was incredible uh, in helping us, helping me set that meeting up, uh, getting uh, invitations out, decorating it, uh, making sure that um, ev everything was uh, as it should be. It was, I agree, it was an amazing evening. Um, I also want to thank the, uh, the production company that donated the time to the city of Newberry to record all that information. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, on uh, September 20th, <coughs> we met at the municipal building to have a community look at the Newberry Six, which was a lynching that occurred in 1916, where four African American men and two African American win women were lynched. Um, it's part of a process called Truth and Reconciliation, where you look back at Jim Crow era practices, you uh, analyze things that happened, you confront them, you talk about them openly. Uh, and you uh, try to find the truth and you try to reconcile as a community and move forward. Um, obviously, that night uh, was a very sensitive night. It could have gone a lot of different directions. Uh, and it was absolutely amazing to see the love and compassion that was on display. Uh, from the beginning invocation to the end of the night, the questions were just spectacular. Um, uh, a young woman started off the night who was a direct descendant of one of the victims and uh, I, I, all the speakers did great but I believe she stole the show. I mean her speech was just incredible uh, and then you know the questions and the comments at the end of the night um, just solidified for me that this is a worthwhile process that there's lots to be learned there's lots of reasons to move forward in this uh, I thought I knew most of the details of the Newberry Six. I learned things that night that I had never heard before. Uh, it helped me understand the situation and the context. Um, and, it, and, and then the response from the public afterwards, I, I don't know that there's been a day that's gone by since that meeting where I haven't been contacted um, by two or three people that say, I, you know, I'm still thinking about it. That was just amazing. When that, when that guy stood up and he said this and this person stood up and he said this, it just gave me goosebumps and so it was really amazing um, uh, I think that the November 18th uh, breaking bread together is going to be another chance for us to just be together commune together talk together fellowship together uh, and come together as one community and that's really what this process is all about you know just talking about our history talking about each other and coming together uh, and realizing that we are one town um, and we, we, have to, we live together and we work together and we worship together and we raise our kids together. So I've just I got to say kudos to everybody who helped out. Thank you, Miss Amy. Couldn't have done it without you. Uh, thank you for everybody that came. It was a great uh, evening. And if you haven't seen any news reports on it, you can look those up online. We will have the videos sometime within the next couple of weeks. The idea is that we will provide the DVD of the night. Uh, 
um, with all this, the talks, all the questions and the answers. Um, we had a camera on, on everybody so that we can cut it all together, make it look nice. We're going to provide it to the school board of Alachua County so that they can distribute it to social studies teachers. So when teachers in the county are teaching uh, Jim Crow era American history, they don't have to talk about abstract things that happened in another state. They can pull material out and talk about things that happened right here. Uh, and, you know, and it's a record of the process, a record of, of what we're working on here in Newberry. So it was a wonderful night. Uh, please join us on November 18th. You're not going to want to miss being a part of this. We're, we're making history in Newberry right now together as a town. And with that, I will close my comments. We'll open up our comments to the citizens. Five minutes to anyone who has anything they'd like to say to address the commission. Don't be shy. Come right up to the podium. You sat here all night long waiting through the, all that budget stuff. Come on and talk to us. And okay. Come on down, sir. Yeah, you'll, you'll break the ice. You'll break the ice. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Mr. Mayor, Commission. Um, my name is uh, Chris Rose II. I'm the director at large, too, for the Libertarian Party of Florida. This is my first uh, chance to speak in front of y'all. I've uh, gotten a little bit familiar with the, uh, with the mayor over the past few months, but this is the first time I've met y'all, so hi. How you doing? Um, just a couple of uh, quick comments, I guess, that um, I formulated by the uh, brief chance I had. I got here a little bit late. I had some other, other business that kept me from you. Um, Any time that uh, you talk about reducing uh, public comment, and, uh, and this is coming from someone who has spoken in front of city and county commission meetings from, uh, from Leon County down to Hillsborough and from Duval down to Orange and quite a few places in between. Um, I, I like to think, and with regard to uh, Commissioner Glanzer's uh, point earlier, Mr. Mayor, um, that um, if you're in this if you're in this seat, sometimes you got to take the good with the bad. The good is when you get to, you know, make votes and and and, and stand up and and be accountable to your you know constituents and everything. And the bad is sometimes listening to people that you just as soon just cut off because they just drone on and on. And maybe I'll do a little bit of that that, that myself from time to time. Um, but it also it gives people uh, like myself who go to these um, a lot of these meetings. Uh, with not really a formulated speech in mind. I'd, I prefer to just try to get a feel for how the meeting's going, for what people are saying, and try to chime in towards the end. Y'all didn't help me out with that tonight at all. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the, the longer I have uh, to formulate, you know, something, the longer I have to listen to other people, gives me an opportunity to prepare what I want to say. And it also, at the same time, it gives y'all a chance to see, um, looking at both sides of this argument, whatever that, you know, whatever it might be that, well, this side, you know, a lot of the people are really prepared and some of them might not even use all their time, but they're making good points. And then this side over here is trying to use as much time as they can just to maybe stall. And they're not really saying much of anything. And that might give you a clue as to how passionate they really are. And I'm, I ain't trying to talk bad about anyone that doesn't really, you know, articulate well, um, you know, or maybe it's their first time up in, up in public, I still get like that sometimes. But just, you know, when you look at the overall um, the stuff that they're saying, I think that's a valuable insight that y'all have uh, that I wouldn't be a fan of taking away. So um, now I'm not a fan of keeping y'all up to the point where you can't focus on what people are saying at the same time though. So maybe if it ain't too late, y'all consider a compromise. I heard five and I heard three. Well, four minutes is right there in the middle. Uh, you know, that time might have already been passed to amend that proposal, but uh, I just wanted to uh, just uh, encourage you uh, on that. Just to let you know, you, you've yes, got sir. two minutes left, and you might have another topic that you might want to discuss before you run out of time. I'm not going to. I'm not going to take. I'm not going to take all, all all five minutes. I decided that when I came up here. So I'm watching that clock right there. I want to talk for a few, more, a few more seconds. That's about it. Um, Dad, Gummit Mary, you broke my train of thought. See, I was on a roll there. Uh, anyway, but it's good to be in front of y'all. Look forward to, to working with you again. Um, I've you know, approached the mayor a couple of times about uh, what y'all are doing over here with, uh, with the way you're saving some water. Uh, I'm also a local candidate. I'm running for um, the conservation district for Group 3, uh, Lotchford County Conservation District. And, um, you know, practice any kind of practice that I can uh, t take to the discussion table uh, that that works, that's efficient, and that doesn't require 
a bigger government agency like the county or even the state, you know, stepping in and coming down, I'm a big fan of. So I look forward to working with you on that. I'm down to a minute now, so I'm going to say goodbye for now. We'll see you again. All right. Good luck in the campaign. Anybody have any questions for the water management candidate? Conservation. Water conservation Good candidate. Conservation. All right. Any other citizen comments? I saw a couple of people who were thinking. There we go. Come on down, sir. Introduce yourself to us. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Kimmerling. I am a resident in Newberry Oaks. And obviously, I believe it was last week, there was a major change to the entrance of my neighborhood. And specifically, in front of my house. Um, I am one of the people that have been affected that there is now public parking in front of my house. Um, there's currently four houses on the east side of 232nd. <coughs> Sorry, 232nd Terrace. Um, there's 16 houses on the west side. And all of the parking spots that have been designated now are only on the east side. Um, that doesn't seem fair to me in that the occasional time that I would use it might be taken up by somebody else. Um, also, the fact that really everybody else that might have children um, now have to park across the street now when they want to load their kids up are concerned because they have to cross a street. Um, the other major concern I have is the fact that the lanes have been narrowed substantially. Um, I drive a Chevy Silverado. I've measured it from mirror to mirror. It's eight feet. The whole road is 26 feet wide. So even dividing it up where one car is parked on the side, you now have close to eight feet worth of traffic lane on both sides. And so I'm going along and I pass another vehicle or one that might be just a little bit wider than mine, I'm now concerned about somebody hitting me, um, not paying attention. The, another thing is, as I was coming in just this, just this evening, there was a U-Haul truck behind me. The wheels of that U-Haul truck were inches away from touching both sides. So. I bring this up in that I am a, I'm a professional delivery driver. I'm on streets all day long. I've never seen any arrangement like this in a residential neighborhood, um, especially one that doesn't have any commercial properties right there where there is public parking required. Um, a couple other concerns. You know, I don't know how this affects the property value of my house, but if somebody were to show up and I list it and they're going to see a parking spot in front of my house, is that going to negatively affect my ability to sell my house? Um, and <laughs> the funny thing is, is when you enter my neighborhood, typically every single night there's only three cars parked on that road and that's on either side. One of them is, is, happens to be a police officer who works at nights, so his car is gone. Um, I have called the commission. I have asked for an explanation, and the thing that has concerned me the most is that there was no notification of any changes that were about to occur. There was no notification of any concerns that were brought up to my neighborhood, uh, whether it be a flyer. I know some people mentioned Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. so. That information would not be provided to me, not even a sign saying, hey, we're discussing something to do with this thoroughfare through. Um, so that was one concern that I had. That was probably the major concern, is that I had no voice in something that my wife informed me while I was at work. She said she left at 9, and then at 12 o'clock, all of a sudden, she comes home, and it's totally changed. So those were my concerns. Um, don't know what's the plan going forward um, and still really haven't been given any information in regards to that, if this is permanent or this is just temporary. So thank you. Thank you, sir. I would say <coughs> that to your concern about the notification, that's a, uh, a completely valid concern and we, we accept that and we own that one. Striping has never been controversial. Um, so I don't think it was on our radar, but mm -hmm. it should have been. And so I apologize that we didn't communicate better 
uh, about that. Uh, other issues have been controversial in the past. We know, hey, that one's going to cause a problem. Yes. You know, if we do that in the neighborhood, everybody's going to come out of the woodwork, and we need to communicate with those folks. Mm -hmm. The striving really has never been so. Mm -hmm. um, so we, it just wasn't on our radar, but that doesn't, that's not an excuse. I'm just telling mm -hmm. you the background. So no, I, I, appreciate I apologize it. for the failure mm -hmm. on our part to communicate to yes. you that that was happening. I appreciate that. And, and, and it's not the striping. I would be totally in favor of striping. I, that's, you know, hey, you stay on this side, I stay on this side. Totally fair, but the parking is really the sure. concern. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a, as a note, I'm sorry, I don't want to keep no, you, you. You can no. sit down and listen to me, but the, the parking is actually a citywide policy that we're trying to get to. Uh, mm -hmm. more on-street parking and they are designated on-street parking in neighborhoods are the issue that we have is that neighborhoods that don't have any striping mm -hmm. people park on both sides of the street mm -hmm. and then the uh, fire trucks can't get through the ambulance can't get through because everybody's parked on both sides so mm -hmm. we want to designate the on-street parking that's applicable mm -hmm. uh, and we hope that the residents will actually utilize their driveways and garages of course. and that the on-street parking would be for the overflow when you have a party when you have those kinds of things so it's it's part of a citywide policy this one came up in response to a request for traffic calming on that mm -hmm. road mm -hmm. um, and so it was sort of a convergence of a citywide policy that we were working towards mm -hmm. and a chance to go ahead and put it into practice mm -hmm. so we'll we'll learn and we'll certainly get better at communicating to folks that's mm -hmm. But you won't be the last neighborhood. This is, this is a concerted effort because we have some neighborhoods that you, the first responders cannot get through those neighborhoods because of so much. You know, everybody these days has three and four vehicles. I and know, they spill out onto the, onto the roads, and then it's, it's difficult when they get narrowed. And you guys had those nice wide roads, we did. which was causing the problem with the speeding. <laughs> so it was kind of a good mm -hmm. chance to try out lots of different policies mm -hmm. that were converging together. So that's just to give you some of the background information on the on-street parking as well. Able to quickly respond? Absolutely. Um, I understand that. I, I, I said I measured it's 26 feet from curb to curb. Uh, using the example of a full-size Chevy vehicle to park on side to side, that's 10 feet of egress. Um, I know that's pretty much kind of standard for two-way traffic roads. So I, I do understand the emergency vehicle. I run into that in my delivery truck. Mm -hmm. many times um, in major leak congested neighborhoods for sure so um, but thank you thank you thank you for coming out tonight come on down man we'll speak to that Let, let's let this lady you go we'll, we'll talk about I, I kept talking with him okay well, <laughs> we'll I'm, also the, with, I'm also a resident of Newberry Oak so sure. you can if you want to finish that no no, no go ahead we'll, we'll okay. make sure we make note of it please introduce right. yourself hi us. I'm Jennifer Wallace I also am a resident of Newberry Oaks on um, 232nd that was just striped without notice um, and I know that when I called the Commission there was a couple concerns one was speed which we did have the stop signs put in it's helped a lot you know for them Thank you're you. not going to stop. I appreciate stop. you saying that. Yeah. That's nice. And it's, it's mainly younger drivers as well as when we had a lot of the work vehicles in the back. So that, I mean, you're not going to stop speeding. It's not. I happen. appreciate you saying that so, too. <laughs> that's why police officers have jobs. Um, but fire, tr the other thing was about fire safety and, and public safety. A fire truck measures across the bumper 99 inches. That's wider than, than the street line, the lines that you guys put in. We have a boat that is wider than the street lanes. Anything that crosses a yellow line, you're automatically responsible by law for hitting that. So we have a boat that's 105 inches. The lane is supposed to be 96 inches. Yeah, right in front of our house, it's seven feet, three inches. So it's almost a, it's more than a foot over. That puts us liable. Our Tahoe is 95 <coughs> inches window, door, um, window to window. That's one inch on either, like total you know for it that's no no leeway you know for it people are not comfortable with these narrow lanes there's been i did the google search several recommendations that a standard lane should be 10 feet for dot um, another national association of city transportation there's other things that recommend a minimum of 28 feet curb to curb ours is 26. ours is too narrow for this this is something that you guys should think about if you're going to do this make them wider because eight feet what their recommendation is eight foot of parking area and then 10, 10 feet each way to allow the 20 feet for fire and, pu and public safety so it's too small also you know we've got commercial vehicles we're in a, we're 
at the main entrance, we've got delivery trucks, we've got garbage trucks, we've got all this stuff coming in there that are hanging out over these, these the lanes that you guys put in there. That's a liability. If I was getting in an accident with my vehicle, I'm gonna sue you guys. I hate to tell you, because you guys are the ones that put in the lane, you guys are uh, putting me in that position with everything, with between my boat hanging over, but there's also you know, trailers and everything else. It's not safe. It's not, it doesn't fit in the lane that you guys provided for me. Um, and then you know, also, thing, something that wasn't considered is our trash days we've had. We just had a trash day today. The trash can is over two feet long. That's taken out of the eight foot. That makes it less than six feet in that lane. You have to get over. There's no way. Are you, you saying the trash over. cans are the in the road? The trash cans. Well, because I called Waste Pro, right. and they use automatic lifts, and they and they put them. You know, they want them on the road. I asked specifically, can it be up on the curb or on the road? And they said, no, it needs to be on the road. No, they're I incorrect look. about that because we'll coach Waste Pro up. They that's illegal for them to put them in the thoroughfare. Okay. They well, because I on looked at because I looked at watched the guy with the recycling bin. The manually he put them in manually if they're up on the curb. But otherwise, they have the, the automatic, you know, dumping and things. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what their website says, too, that needs to be on, on the road and on the curb. Also, how you guys put it, there's no room for margin of safety. You're on the side, the west side, but there's 16 houses there. There's no margin of safety if a kid throws a ball on the road or anything else, because normally you kind of drift in the middle and have that, that margin of safety. You're already, my vehicle's as wide as a rent lane, and I've got nothing if, if a kid was to get out, out there. Um, you know, as Mark said, my house is on, on the west side, so I only have access to two parking spaces in mine because I've got a sidewalk there. So we have two vehicles. My husband is a police officer, so we have three. So one of ours gets to park across and, and down a little bit from Mark. But if I've got anybody else, they've got to go halfway down the block, you know, this thing. So if I got my grandmother or anything else that needs to come up and, you know, and, and come a couple houses up, it looks like downtown Gainesville. It looks terrible. You know, it's I. We moved to a small city. It you. It totally wiped out any type of small city, you know, at, at, at atmosphere and feel that you guys you know have put you know on here. Also, there's been show, studies shown that, that actually the narrow streets actually increase the accident rate. You know, because you are removing that uh, that margin of safety. There has been the speed studies. It the the lowest the narrowest it's gone to is just below 10 feet. Nothing about eight feet. You know, for it. And I don't know where, there's nothing in the city code, there's supposed to be an exe design exemption if they are narrower than 10 feet. I couldn't find anything in our ordinances that would allow that. So, you know, and again, what Mark said, we just weren't told, you know, also that, that really, you know, it just was done. You know, there wasn't even a sign that we were, this is happening, this is being discussed, hey, move your vehicles off the road, this, it just happened. That's, you know, what really burned a lot mm -hmm. of us, so. Thank you, ma'am. Come on down, introduce yourself to us. Good evening, my name is Shelby Powell. I'm a resident on 232nd as well. And I was invited here tonight to talk about the uh, lane striping that we had recently developed on our street. It was about two weeks ago now. Um, it doesn't affect me at all. I'm the first house in the neighborhood. I have a parking spot maybe 10 feet adjacent to my house. Really no issue for me. But what I have seen is that I've walked through this process with the city trying to get speed tables installed. And this was, I think, thrown to our neighborhood as a bone of sorts. And I think that, that the, I appreciate that there has been attention given to this, but again, the mark has been missed. So a quick recap of where we're at. We have a speed study showing that we have speeds up to 80 miles an hour in our 25 mile an hour residential neighborhood. Now, not enough people are doing 80 miles an hour to reach the 25th percentile, or 85th percentile is what I believe it needs to be. However, we have a professional engineer's recommendation for speed tables. We also have that same professional engineer's recommendation that stop signs do not work. And we also have an overwhelmingly successful petition from our neighbors. So Mark, who you heard earlier, his voice was submitted to this dais. He voted for speed tables. Same with Jennifer, who you just heard as well. So our neighbors have experienced the speeding on this road. It's been a problem. I appreciate that you've tried to fix it. But I drive a small four-door sedan. It's very narrow. I go to check my mail, and I nearly lose a side mirror because the lanes are that narrow. It's extremely narrow. So I would like to read the professional engineer's recommendation and opinions for our street. 
Is this from the draft that he submitted or from his final report after he had all the speed studies and all the data? I asked the city what this was. The report was revised at some point, but no additional data was provided to the engineer. There was a teleconference set up, an apology issued by the engineer, and a new report was sent. So I'm not sure where this falls, but none of the data changed in the report. So I'm going to read his findings. Okay. And this is the report that we paid a professional engineer $4,000 to create. But in the final report, his recommendation was against speed tables. And no, he doesn't say he's against speed tables in his final report. He changes he says the no wording. Need to do. No need to do. No need to do take any further action because speeding is not an issue. Okay, so that's an interesting point that you make. He does include that verbiage. However, the city sent that specific verbiage to him saying we thought this was going to be in the report. The professional engineer responds after this teleconference for which there is no backing, no data, no notes, nothing submitted, and says I apologize that I missed the mark. But again, no additional data was provided. And as I read from these opinions and findings, you'll see that even new data wouldn't have changed some of these opinions. Okay. So and we'll give I, you 30 more seconds. So you can, I just you. want to clarify that if we're reading from a draft or the final report. No, I appreciate that clarification. Sure. I think it's important. Based upon the speed data received from the Sheriff's Department, clearly there is speeding along Northwest 232nd Terrace between Northwest 3rd Avenue and 7th Road in bold and underlined all caps. Traffic calming measures should be considered such as speed tables. The subdivision of Newberry Oaks has substantially changed in just two short years with the current housing boom, which is adding construction traffic and new owners, visitors utilizing Northwest 232nd Terrace daily. In bold, all caps and underlined. This speeding condition will continue unless rectified by traffic calming or other alternatives as listed below. The speed table request petition was signed in December 2017 by the residents along Northwest 232nd Terrace and appears to meet the adopted speed table policy and procedures. The only caveat is that there is no clear determination if Northwest 232nd Terrace is a minor collector or a collector road. In all caps, bold and underlined. This policy under resolution 2015-28 was followed. If the traffic calming measures, such as speed tables, are installed along Northwest 232nd Terrace within the study, prior to an installation, speed and volume studies should be accomplished on parallel or other affected streets for background data due to potential avoidance of the traffic calmed area. Again, all caps, bold and underlined, before and after studies should be provided with all traffic calming installed devices for credibility. The three-way stop signs installed at the intersection of Northwest 232nd Terrace at Northwest 5th Place have slightly reduced the speeds along Northwest 232nd Terrace. However, as vehicle traffic builds in the neighborhood and pedestrians increase with the boom of houses within this neighborhood, the stop sign control will slowly act as a passive control and the need for enforcement will be requested to stop the running of the stop condition. In bold, all caps, Underlined, the stop sign at Northwest 5th Place will not solve the speeding problem along Northwest 232nd Terrace. This is the professional engineer's recommendation. Perhaps he revised some of this, what appears from the email chains that I've read, based off of recommendation by the city. Now again, we have a successful petition. We have speeds of up to 80 miles per hour in our residential neighborhood. We have professional engineer's recommendation and his direct statement that stop signs are not going to work. What we do have is we've had this dais promise us that it will stop any attempt to get speed tables, including with threats of violence and intimidation. So what might have seemed like a not controversial issue has become very controversial. And I think that in this process, in this bureaucratic process, we've lost sight of just common sense. Speed tables, as the engineer stated, cost a meager $4,200. I respect trying to pinch pennies. However, no, we've missed rapidly. the mark. Thank you, sir. Okay, further comments? Ladies first. Christina Stainfield, resident of Newberry Oaks. I just wanted to say how much I approve of the parking spaces and the striping on 232nd. I think the ultimate goal for the neighborhood was to reduce the speeding and I think that has been accomplished between the striping and the parking spots and the stop signs. And I think the goal was reached at a much lesser cost to the citizens of Newberry, especially those that don't live in Newberry Oaks. So I appreciate this alternative because I was against the speed tables and happy that they're not there. And I think that this works and I appreciate the city for doing it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.
Welcome, sir. You thought you could get a night without me? Negative, Ghost Rider. Naeem Urged, citizen of Newberry. Um, asking the government to infringe or spend my money on something like speed tables for one neighborhood makes a libertarian like me fringe. It's a waste of money. I'm sorry, but if we're gonna put speed tables, we might as well start investing in the whole town and become speed in the new town of speed tables. Because before we put speed tables in a neighborhood, I would ask the commission to consider the safety of the children at Oakview Middle School, the safety of our children at Newberry Elementary School, where we have a school zone of 20 miles an hour that turns into a speed limit of 20 miles an hour after the school zone, which nobody respects. And we have kids in bicycles, children walking, one crossing guard. If speed tables are gonna be anywhere, should be protecting our children. But we don't have petitions of parents screaming and ranting about speed tables in those areas. I live down a race path on 251st. I moved into Oakview Village, which happens to be the nice shortcut to bypass the, speed, the school zones. And every day, lo and behold, we have a white, nice little Mazda Miata that works at B&E Electric that loves to bypass the school zone and almost hits my kid twice. I'm not screaming for a speed zone. And I applaud the city for actually even considering putting stripes on on public. I wish the city would come into our neighborhood into a private road and put some stripes on, but it's not necessary. It's, it's my issue. We bring it up. We take care of it as human beings. Um, I would ask that the city seriously seriously consider not doing this because you got one neighborhood that gets it where does it stop it's four thousand two hundred dollars if i'm not mistaken that's old ball but then you know things go wrong things get delayed five thousand two hundred six thousand two hundred okay but then the next neighborhood wants them how many go in that neighborhood where does it stop that makes a libertarian like me cringe knowing that we're going to spend the money that we worked so hard to get to on speed tables. Thank you, sir. Jim Stainfield, citizen. Uh, I also live in Newberry Oaks, and um, I agree with the striping also. Uh, I kind of remember the meeting where the engineer was standing here, and he talked about there was there was a speeding issue in our neighborhood until they put in the stop signs. And it appears, he came up here and said the stop signs solved the issue, no further issue, no, nothing else needs to be done. But he offered up striping, and you guys offered up striping, and then they agreed to it. They go, oh, that sounds like a good idea, why don't you do that? Well, now I, they put in the striping, and now they're complaining about it, which I find very funny. Because it accomplished exactly what we wanted. We wanted slower, we wanted slower traffic through the neighborhood, now we've got it. So that was the first issue, was the striping. Uh, I have a second issue I'd like to bring up. We have one particular citizen and, uh, that is doing a public records request. Now, I know that's a legal way to do it. You, anybody, any citizen can ask for public press records. But we have one citizen abusing this public records request. And he's been asking, actually he's put in one request a week since the end of July and it's using up our staff time. And that is Mr. Powell over here. He's using up our staff time, it's using up my tax dollars on something I think is a personal vendetta. And I've got a real problem with that. Excuse me, well, he gets his five minutes. Lastly, um, there's been a lot of talk in Newberry about the feel of Newberry, about the animosity toward a lot of people. And I believe a lot of this has to do with Facebook and the Facebook groups. I think people would be much happier if they would delete any Newberry Facebook group they have in their Facebook account. 
Spot Facebook is fine for dealing with your, with staying in touch with people and all, but these groups are sowing dissension in our community. Uh, they have, people will sit behind a keyboard and say things they would never say openly to somebody else. And I think if they went out and they started putting up their keyboards and went out and started doing things in the community and talking to people in the community, they would find out the same information. And I, I think it would be more beneficial to everybody in a more pleasant community if they just get rid of their Newberry Facebook groups. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further comment? You had two minutes left on your time, Mr. <coughs> Naeem. Uh, Naeem Merchant, uh, Newberry Citizen. Uh, public comments, announcements. Uh, so, so we know St. Vincent de Paul Society is a society run by the Catholic Church. Um, it has, it's a nonprofit. All proceeds go to the poor of the local community. Newberry is looking to open up their new chapter. Um, I unfortunately cannot be the vice president of that chapter because of work duties and uh, other stuff that I am doing already for uh, around the local community. However, there is a walk taking place next week um, the 29th at Queen of Peace. They have a track. They're doing a walk run uh, just to raise money. Believe it or not, this money is to open up a Newberry chapter where all the money, all the food, any mattresses that you donate to the St. Vincent de Paul goes directly to the Newberry community. It doesn't go to Trenton or uh, High Springs. It stays here and helps those here. So it's another avenue for them uh, to work here. I wanted to make that announcement. I also wanted to thank the mayor for... Uh, for the great and um, for the commission and the staff for putting on a great uh, for the Newberry Six. It was very emotional, pulled on some serious heartstrings, um, and I was glad to see um, the, the community that came about it. Um, and I will quote that uh, older gentleman that did say, um, after everything that was done, this uh, fellow older man came up and said, after everything that we have done to you, um, to your to your grandparents or great grandparents, you still loved us anyways. So I stand here, even if I'm mad or angry. It, it's you know what well, we're all human beings. You know we all have an opinion, and uh, as long as we can learn to grow and, and learn from each other, um, and keep Newberry going strong. So thank right. you. That was a very powerful moment that night. Absolutely. Other comments. Welcome back, All sir. Right. Yeah. As, a, as somebody who Tell us how a libertarian candidate feels about traffic I, calming. As a libertarian ca uh, candidate and as somebody who has uh, two houses in Newbury Oaks that they're going to look at with a realtor sometime in the next few weeks, uh, what if Northwest 232nd is a, a private road, what uh, options do the citizens of Newbury Oaks have to uh, do this initiative on their own? Uh, what what per what would they need to accomplish to come together as citizens and, and make the decision to put in speed tables? Mr. New, you want to take that question? It, it was offered to them to create a special taxing unit that would pay for these kinds of things. That, that offer was denied. Uh, Mr. Powell's been sort of the voice of that community, uh, so he's been, he was my point of contact. <laughs> He was my point of contact for talking to, you know, uh, and he was talking to the rest of that street about what was going on. I, I realize that may have been a mistake, <laughs> uh, but I, my understanding <laughs> was that was kind of what was happening. Um, but so to the to Mr. Cadill's question about do they have one way of accomplishing financing uh, public infrastructure for us for a smaller group than uh, that only benefits a small portion of your community would be through a process called special assessments. Um, and uh, the, the commission has the authority to unilaterally decide to uh, approve special assessments for district, but, but typically that doesn't happen um, because they're all elected and they don't want to upset folks. So typically it takes overwhelming support. In my experience, um, you'd need support in the 70 to 75% range throughout by the whole neighborhood. And because, uh, much of the neighborhood utilizes the street segment as opposed to just the people that front it, then um, you would uh, want to make sure that the entire neighborhood was part of, of that special assessment district. But then the way it would work is the city would take the total cost to install the, um, the uh, speed tables, if that's what's selected, and uh, uh, divide them 
uh, by the number of residents that were in those special assessment district. Um, usually there's a nominal interest rate and they spread it over a number of years. It gets assigned to the property. So if you, if you um, move, the subsequent homeowner still picks up the obligation to pay that fair uh, portion of the special assessment. And typical uh, repayment periods are in the 10, 10 year period for something of this nature. If it's very extensive, it might be uh, a 20 year type of special assessment. So it's like the counties discussed with our uh, stormwater management doing special assessments for like Robin Lane area. That is yeah. correct. Okay. Right. So, uh, you know, maybe uh, if there are citizens that are concerned and, you know, their citizens are on both sides, I just ask to reinvestigate that issue with the citizens themselves and the community going for, out. For speed study, sir, just to just before you make it sound like we haven't addressed this, oh, we've yeah, been talking about speed yeah. tables for about a year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so we've, we've, investigations has, have happened I just galore. <laughs> invite the citizens, if they're still feeling sure. passionate about it, to, to take it upon themselves to, to, to readdress the issue in their own neighborhood and see what support they can get for something that funds it for the people that will use it. Sure. As a libertarian. That's, I that's would say, you know, the interesting thing for me as from your political standpoint on this one is that, you know, th this started off with, with traffic calming. And I remember having a, a very candid conversation with Mr. Powell one day because his issue was the speeding in front of his house. He's got small kids. He's worried about them. We all get that. Uh, and he was, uh, he, he was adamant about speed tables. And I asked him, well, is it, if we can have another traffic calming measure that uh, that uh, is effective, is that fine? Or is it speed tables the only thing that will satisfy? And he said the issue the issue is traffic calming. We got to stop the speeding. So I said fine. Let let's see what we can do to stop the speeding, because the problem is one, according to our policy, once you do these studies, if ASO comes back and says that it doesn't hit the bar. Uh, to put in speed tables, our policy is you got to hit that bar to get that response. So we did four of those speed studies because we had questions about the studies, uh, we had criticisms of the studies. So we've been overly responsive on this issue uh, to the point where, you know, this was the very first time where we've had this policy tested. Uh, you know, we were putting in speed tables to uh, some of the folks, I think it was uh, Naeem said, we at one point in time we were kind of putting in speed tables just upon request we didn't really have a way to go about it so we instituted this policy and this was the first neighborhood that had got this far in the policy so before we gave a definitive no to mr powell that i'm sorry the speed studies don't warrant speed tables we actually went out and did our due diligence to hire an engineer to test the policy he did not and i've seen this misspoken on social media many times we did not hire the engineer to test that road. We use the road and the issue to test the policy Adds out of an abundance of caution and, a, and an abundance of a desire to be responsive to the citizens. So we spent taxpayer money to test the policy. The, the engineer stood here and I admit that he said both what Mr. Powell said and what Mr. Stainfield said because at one point in time as an offhand comment he said he wasn't in favor of stop signs. But at, in his report, he said the stop signs had been effective. Despite that, and the fact that the last speed study we did had a less than five, a less than 0.5 percent speeding issue on that road, this commission still approved to move forward with the striping again as an as a, a way to try to be responsive to the residents of that street who maybe we were not uh, necessarily. Uh, in tune with as much as we thought that we were in tune with. After we went through the petition cycle, I think we thought that there was sort of a collective body and Mr. Powell was the voice of that body. So I apologize to making that assumption that you had appointed a talking uh, a spokesperson for them, uh, for yourselves. And I certainly apologize that we did a bad job of communicating when the striping um, went down. So, uh, you know, I appreciate your response. I just give you kind of the background of how we got to here. I and it's been a very ongoing issue for us. Yes, um, and we we will certainly to the question. I think, sir, you asked about is this temporary or is this permanent? I mean, I think for now it's a, it's a permanent fixture. We will certainly look at the widths and we'll make sure that we're in. And before you start calling out, if you want to speak again, I need you to come to the mic. But we'll certainly look at the widths. We'll check the FDOT. We have a report from our own uh, fire chief in favor of the striping and the way it went out. 
Uh, I think the plan at this point is to give it a test period and, uh, and then look at the studies. I've driven that road um, at least four times since it went in. And I, at 20 miles an hour, now I drive a small vehicle, but I've crossed big vehicles. It is tight. It, I, I grant you that. But I also grant that's exactly the goal of the striping was to pinch the road. And we talked about that explicitly. I talked to Mr. Powell about it. I talked to the engineer about it to make, to make it uncomfortable and to force people to slow down. Uh, because our understanding of this dais, perhaps incorrectly, was that entire street was unified behind something had to be done. So I apologize that we did a bad job communicating that to you. Sometimes we make assumptions and it's the wrong assumption. Uh, and you know, I, I certainly could have come and tried to knock on more doors and, and find out and make sure this was actually the will of everybody. It does, however, fit that greater citywide policy of trying to increase and get the designated parking so that we don't have the issue of, of the crowding. Because that really is a, 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 an emergency first responder issue when you, when you get a neighborhood that parks on both sides and the, and the vehicle simply can't get through. So I, that would be the answer. If anyone wants to come back up and respond, I certainly, since I directed the response to you, I'd give you a little bit more time. But I believe that's our plan. If we find out that the striping uh, violates something, we'll certainly address it. But at this point, I think that's our concept. Would you like to come back up, Mike, or, or ma'am? Sure. Um, the moment the stop signs went in, totally for that, it did slow down traffic, especially on the, sp on the second half. Wait, wait, wait. So the, wait, wait, wait. Before you go crazy. The first half, which is the steepest downhill incline, which when people leave, they accelerate more easily. They might not realize it. That would be like the only place that would make sense to me to have one speed table if there was any to go in the neighborhood. The other comment I have is since the stop signs have gone in, I have noticed huge increases of residents that live in the back. They no longer go down that street. They go down the, the street right next to it. Exactly. And they, so, so again, understand speeding, understand emergency egress. I will say on your road, sir, there, there are more cars that park side by side then obviously the two or three that are on the the 232nd and the other thing is is i understand there's other residents that live in the neighborhood there are multiple multiple ways of entering and exiting that neighborhood so the question is is does it affect everybody evenly equally does it slow down traffic because people are exiting through another street and that's, I, I've seen it. I, I, have a, I have a brother in law who lives in the back, and that's, they, <laughs> the moment the stop signs went in, you started to notice that they go down 233rd Drive. They I've had three over. people in Newberry Oaks ask me for striping <laughs> since that striping went in. It's been a. Understood, but at the hit. same, it, I, I maybe not the, the narrowness, but the striping itself has the been. The striping a hit. is one thing, I understand, but I, trust me, with how many people that park on that road, you will hear somebody in there the same exact statements that I'm making of this is unfair because now I can't park in front of my house because somebody else is occupying it. So I understand. Thank you. Thank that you was, for that your was comments. Kind of, and, and wait, I'm sorry, one more question. The question mm -hmm. was is, it was brought up that it was $4,200 per speed table is the Not, average? I think it was close? for two, 4200 for both of them. For two of them, so. Is that right? But we way, had some way. disagreement among either the engineers. Way, either way, <laughs> yeah. my question would be is how much was the stripe, how much did the striping cost? 30? Uh, um, best of my recollection, it was a little under 3000 28 2900 Okay, yeah. okay. That, so in comparing the two, one could have also achieved the same and for relatively the same price. And Mr. Mayor, as, as you pointed out, the, the striping accomplished two objectives. Uh, speed tables would slow, mm -hmm. is, is traffic calming, mm -hmm. and, the traf and the striping is traffic calming and mm -hmm. parking. Mm -hmm. And the speed tables would, no, would do nothing to address the parking issues that we're experiencing in neighborhoods. The parking as far as emergency vehicle egress, is that what you're yeah, talking when, about? Yeah, when, when cars are parked mm -hmm. opposite one another on either mm -hmm. side of the road, mm -hmm. um, then we don't have sufficient room to get fire apparatus through there. And on occasion, mm -hmm. that has resulted in us you know, not being able to find mm -hmm. the owner of the vehicle, having the back out, taking an alternate route in. 
Understood. We that. haven't lost anybody, but uh, in Gainesville, they lost a house mm -hmm. uh, because no, I understand. of that type of my issue. My, my, my brother's a firefighter. I understand those concerns. And I would just say, in, in what other neighborhoods is, has this been implemented? This was, the, this was the first, correct? Right, this, this was the this first. We've had this policy. Mm -hmm. Every neighborhood has a unique challenge uh, to figuring course. out. And it, you know, part of that, the cost and the striping is, mm -hmm. you know, people make fun of government all the time. But when you and actually that, are I brought, government. I brought it up to say, hey, is it cheaper to <laughs> yeah. do one or the other? When you actually are concerned. government, yes. you, have to, you, you have to play by the rules. Understood. Well, at least when you're municipal government, mm -hmm. you have to play by the rules. Understood. And so we have to have an engineer. Yes. <laughs> That, that goes in and helps us figure out all of the wits and where Understood. the parking places go and Understood. all that kind of stuff. So it's not just $3,000 on the paint. Understood. It's the, and the only thing I would add to what Mike said is that this body is under tremendous pressure from first responders to make speed tables a, a, an absolute last resort. It slows them down to Understood. get to where they need to Understood. go. And, so it, and I was very honest with Mr. Powell that from the beginning that, you know, uh, and the stop speed, signs have, the stop signs have right. tremendously. Speed I, I tables are always... Mm -hmm. You know, there's just no other way to, to, to crack this nut, and then we'll, we go with the speed Obviously. table. So. And I understand emergency vehicle egress, but also when you do have two cars parked to the side, you do kind of accomplish the same as a narrowing of lanes. <laughs> yeah. So, but as I understand, I know, Tim, I know, Tim, you used to live on 233rd as well, and obviously, Mr. Coleman, you do as well. So, any. Commissioner yeah, Martin. I did. I, I did used to live on that road. Uh, it always baffled me why people couldn't use their driveways or their garages. Understood. Uh, so that's a concern. Yeah, the speed tables are a concern for emergency vehicles. Uh, you know, I, quite frankly, we get into we get stuck in the into a point where mm -hmm. it's we're kind of a no-no win situation sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you know, I appreciate you mm -hmm. coming up here and speaking directly with us and not doing it through a Facebook medium or anything like that. I think I it's the appropriate thing, to, <laughs> appropriate thing to do. And uh, I mean, I think this is all part of the discussion. And I appreciate you being an ad adult about it and coming mm -hmm. up and talking to us. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. I gave you a chance. I, I talked to you, ma'am. So if you want some more time, we'll put a, another minute on your time clock to to address those. So, yeah, um, you know, I know when Shelby came through with the speed table thing, it was before the, the stop sign, and I told him at the time, it's probably, you're not going to stop speeders. It's going to happen, and all you're going to hear is the chunk chunk of the, of the speeders. Also, a couple of neighbors of mine, you know, have low riding cars. Speed tables are going to, they're going to be trapped with that. The same thing with, you know, the fire department. They said speed tables are, um, you know, they're better than speed humps, but, you know, they're still delaying things. But I just feel like there's a lot of issues that, if we had a public forum and you guys flyered the, you know, the, the street, that we could have all come together. Like, we didn't even see a plan, you know, with this whole thing. And the, there's, you know, so many things. Like, there's the access to the gas line on our street. It doesn't have much, much um, issue to the entrance of that. Was that taken into consideration for Florida Public Utilities being able to get up there and, and you know, get to the, the gas, you know, for it? Well, we pay the engineer, there. it should. Okay. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, and honestly, you didn't pay the person who striped enough because it looks bad. Everything was is wavy, and it doesn't. It wasn't a good job. So you should have paid him probably close to four thousand, you know, four thousand dollars or more. Apparently, it was he was in and out of there pretty quick. But what's in there, like I said, doesn't even look good. So if you look at it, it's not straight. Don't it? Affects my type A just a little bit. So <laughs> with, I, with, I can with, understand with the, that. With the, with, the, with the roads doing this and the lines yep. doing this and the right. different the different sections of. The I'd stripes. have to be out there with a little marker and, and yeah. straighten them up. Like I some would, of the stripes are 12 feet, some of them are OCD like nine and a half feet. <laughs> yeah, it, it really affects me, you know, with okay. the whole thing. So just like I said, it, if you all are doing it somewhere else, find somebody else to do it. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Any other? No, I gave you ex I gave you extra time already, sir. <laughs> Did I address you? I'll, I'll grant that. So give a, him a, an extra couple minutes here too, Miss Amy. Thank you. Yeah, a couple points of clarification. First, I'm a libertarian as well, believe it or not. If there was actually a mechanism in place for us to fix this problem, I would do it. I've looked into starting our own voluntary HOA. It can't do it. It doesn't exist. No process in place. This is an issue that only you guys can solve for us. Um, you mentioned earlier that the engineer was hired to evaluate the policy. As Jim so acutely pointed out, I've read every email, every report, I've read every single document. 
He never once makes a comment about the assessment of the policy other than to say that I followed it to the T. Another point of clarification. Maybe I'm not the best spokesperson, but I certainly told the city that our residents would not be in favor of this striping. I said, if there is a problem, if you recognize there is a problem, go ahead and fix it. I've also on numerous occasions recognized that the stop signs have slowed speeding. It punishes every single person in the back of our neighborhood. They have to come to a full and complete stop. I don't have to do that. I don't know if you guys know. I live in front of all the stop signs. It doesn't bother me, but it punishes every neighbor. <coughs> Speed tables would allow them to drive faster without having to come to a stop. The issues about low vehicles, the engineer cleared that up. About emergency vehicles, the engineer cleared that up. Said all these vehicles pass over these things fine and in fact more efficiently than these other mechanisms that we've been discussing. All these issues have been resolved. The issue about the opening the floodgates, totally valid. I worry about that as well. Let me remind you, this policy was created in 2015 for our neighborhood. In three years, we're the only neighborhood to get through this process. You're not gonna open the floodgates. If there are other roads with speeding issues, fix them. If you're the only one who can fix them, fix them. That's why we pay taxes. I've paid a lot of taxes. Excuse me, sir. Okay, name. Anyhow, thank you. That's what I have to say. I just want to clear up those three points. Thank you again for your attention to this matter. You guys have been very attentive to it. Again, I hope you fix it. Don't miss the mark on the second bench. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I don't want to cut anybody off. Anybody else wants to say anything else? I certainly don't want to beat a dead horse. I would simply want to say that the only point that I would disagree with what Mr. Powell just said was that when the policy and the studies show that you don't need and the recommendation is not to take action, for this board to then violate the policy and then go and put in speed tables anyway, that's where we have used the metaphor of the floodgate. So uh, we keep missing that one last piece there, and it's an important piece when we're talking because if this body approves speed tables without actually fulfilling the requirements of the policy, then the policy is now pointless because all you got to do is, is complain loud enough and be a squeaky wheel long enough, and it doesn't really matter what the policy says. So. I just want to make sure that that point, I've tried, to, I've tried to clarify that before. It doesn't really seem to be getting through, but that's where the floodgates thing, because if, if you're not going to hear to the policy, then why have the policy? So when, the, when staff says you don't need them, we've done four studies. ASO says you don't need them. The engineer says you don't need them. Then you don't need them. And that's what, how we got here, actually by trying to be too responsive, because we should have just said no. At that point, the engineer said no, we wouldn't have striping. It would have just been a hard no. And we tried to continue on and try to figure out, and that's what's got the rest of the neighborhood upset. And again, I apologize for not communicating uh, to you guys. And uh, with that, if there's anybody else, you folks have waited here very patiently all night. If you've got anything you want to say, now would be a great time. Hearing no further comments. Oh, one more. Oh, I'm glad you said that, Ms. Amy, because I have one more comment too. And I'll make it quick, I promise. Farm share is this Saturday. You stole it right out of September my mouth. September 29th at the American Legion. It begins at 10 a.m. They do still need volunteers. We always need volunteers. Volunteers, we don't expect you to get there at 6.30, but we'd love you to be there at 6.30. It's a food distribution. Last time we had about 30 kids from Oakview Middle School and Newberry High School, uh, various up, um, people. Thank you, Commissioner Hurstum. You were there. Most, everybody's pitched in at one point or another. We appreciate it. Um, I think we fed just under 500 families, uh, but it's a massive undertaking to feed that many people in about two hours. So it's a partnership between the city of Newberry. We help by providing a f uh, forklift just to get the stuff off, and then the rest is just volunteers that come in and, and make this thing happen. Volunteerism at its best. Any other comments? It's American Legion on the way out to Trenton. Hearing none, going once, going twice, we are adjourned.